Okay, great. Well, hi everyone, and thank you for joining our second AA Global Forum event to launch the Caribbean Global Forum. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Manishay Burgis, and I'm the head of public engagement at the Architectural Association. Um, to tell you a bit about the AA Global Forums, they're an initiative developed as a hybrid between our public program and the visiting school program as a way to connect our global network of alumni, members, visiting schools, partners, prospective students and friends as a space to learn, share and discuss architectural ideas and initiatives in a local context, both online and through on-site meetings, lectures and workshops, uh, wherever that's possible. So the Caribbean Global Forum specifically will provide the AA community already within or returning to the Caribbean region with a venue for connection and an opportunity to network. And today's launch event explores a number of contemporary issues relevant to the region with three sessions focusing on the themes of urban development and the sustainable growth of cities, natural disasters and resiliency, and advanced methodology of design and its adaptability to the Caribbean environment. And that last session will be in Spanish with live translation. So these global forum events are by nature collaborative and help us feel more connected at a time when we're all geographically separated and therefore looking at issues of sustainability, resilience and adaptability and how we can learn from models developed across the Caribbean region is a terrific focus for today's conversation and I'm really looking forward to hear what you all have to say. Um, the first global forum event was held at the beginning of May in Melbourne and uh, discuss the future of architectural education as the collaboration between the AA and the Melbourne School of Design at the University of Melbourne. And um, upcoming Global Forum events include um, some which will be held in Berlin and also in South Korea. And we hope that these events will be an exciting way to connect our audiences around the world. And we'd like to invite everyone here today to also try and join us for other events in the public program, or to come spend some time with us at the AA in London when possible, or at any of our international programs through the visiting school. So we look forward to an exciting series of discussions over the next few hours. And um, just as a reminder, there's also an opportunity for all participants to join a spatial chat at the end as a way to connect the, with fellow Global Forum participants in a digital space. And um, I guess to begin our program of, of talks, I'm delighted to introduce Patricia Green, an AA alumna and former head of the Caribbean School of Architecture at the University of Technology in Jamaica where she's currently also program director of the faculty's MPhil PhD in the built, in the built environment and directs its downtown cities lab. Um, in addition to studying at the AA, Patricia earned a doctorate from the Universidad de Sevilla in Spain and a master of science in historic preservation from the University of Pennsylvania in, um, in the States. And today we'll be talking about A alumni engendering Caribbean architecture education and Caribbean modernism. So without any further ado, I will hand over to Patricia to get us started. Oh, oh thank you. Yes, I just want to say thank you so much to um, everyone. And in particular, I want to mention um, John Naylor, who, was, who initiated this entire idea of having a global forum. And I want to thank you, John, Beatrice and Raj and everyone else who has just worked so hard, the members of the planning committee. It's my honor, privilege and joy to be here this morning. And it's quite a responsibility to be the first speaker. So I look forward to the rest of the sessions. Thank you very much. Um, the Caribbean School of Architecture was actually founded um, established in 1988, and this is, is very significant for the Caribbean, especially the English Caribbean. So I am now calling this presentation the Commonwealth Caribbean, because some aspects happened over the years, particularly related to the AA, that has impacted directly the development of modern architecture and architectural education in the Caribbean. And I start with the, the Caribbean School of Architecture. And also we'd like to just showcase two projects, one from the undergraduate Sorry, Patricia, you've um, gone on mute. Are you able to hear now? Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't know what happened a while ago. So we're, we're looking at 
the current trend. And the Caribbean School of Architecture was founded by graduates from the, the AA. And we want to start at the beginning. At this time, there are about 27, 28 um, graduates from the AA who I have been able to accumulate over the last few weeks in trying to pull together. And some of them are here. So this presentation will showcase their work. But why did so many persons from the Caribbean go to the AA? And we start with Otto Konigsberg in terms of him setting up the Department of Tropical Architecture between 1954 to 57 and 1970 to 71. It ended critical information. In addition to that, during the course of time, he was in um, the University of Costa Rica, and he helped to establish the tropical architecture and thinking and education in that. Now, we start with our very first AA alumni, the late Ruskin Punch from Trinidad and Tobago. And we can see here the influence these persons, you will see the dates of their time at the AA, and it included years that they did for year out. Some of them stayed further to do this diploma and did other things and went to other countries. Russ King Punch came back and was instrumental in helping with the establishment of uh, Caribbean modernism. We also have Neil Richards. Neil Richards, along with Kingsley Robottom from Jamaica, started in 1962. 1962 was the year that both Trinidad and Tobago, as well as Jamaica, gained independence. So the government was sending a number of persons from the Caribbean to the AA because of this whole attraction and the work of the Tropical Architecture Department. That included Jane Drew and um, Maxwell, sorry, Maxwell Fry, who also were heading and working along with Connersburg and others in this department. We have Clyde Bacchus. We can see the time that he was there in 1964, coming from Trinidad, and there were others. And we have Brian Lewis, who's actually here. Thank you, Brian, and we welcome you. We hope to hear from you. And Brian has been doing a fantastic set of photographs across the Caribbean, just recording architecture. And we see Brian, who understanding that at the time it was post-war and the British government, the UK, was sending out professionals to the um, developing world, Africa, India, and the Caribbean. And so we see Brian here as the son of one of our um, Caribbean people. So he will speak. I'll not speak for him. But this is um, Mervyn Awan. And I want to say that some of these projects that you're looking at are actually award-winning projects. And you can see the kind of tropicalism, the modern tropicalism of openness and airiness and lightness in terms of the design from a one who came from Trinidad initially and practiced primarily in Barbados. And then we had next in line is uh, in the 60s is Sarah Anne Hodges, as we affectionately call her. And this is another award-winning scheme with strawberry hills. Again, you can see the interpretation of the traditional and the historic architecture being used in a contemporary manner being introduced here. Again, all the elements of tropicalism coming out. And then we have Cosmo White. Now, Cosmo was the last batch of AA people who came when the School of Tropical Architecture was just ending. And Cosmo was a beneficiary who went to the University of Kamasi to work, and he did a year there. And this is one of his projects, Fisherman's Point, with the hotel development. So the Caribbean have the, their housing and all kinds of things that are happening. Now, I'm speaking about Richard Johnston, who is in the U.S., and he. this is one of the schemes that he did when he went there. And I want to mention that Richard worked for many years with Shanklon Cox in England, who did tropical architecture and did a number of housing projects in the Caribbean. And so the whole aspect of tropical architecture, housing and development was really um, coming out at that time from AA Caribbean graduates. And
And I just want us to go and reminisce back to see what the AA was like in 1972 when I arrived. And I thank the archives to, for these images. And to let you all know that myself and Mark Taylor and Penelope Blame, Mark Taylor is from Jamaica, Penelope Bramel and myself were the three Caribbean persons who started the same year as Dame Zaha. Moisen, who is a former head of school, was also in the year before I came. And so uh, we have these very important connections at a time when things were changing. So the School of Tropical Architecture had ended. And so we have a situation where we were coming in and we were told when we left the Caribbean, we're sending you to the AA so you can design for hot, humid climates. And when we went, it ended. How do we handle this? This is a season when we were talking about deconstructivism. Uh, one of the things that I have developed in my professional practice is to look back at the architectural heritage and um, the whole issue of resilience and buildings that have survived. And so this is one of my Caribbean projects from the government of the Cayman Islands, where I was asked to do the restoration of this um, museum, which was destroyed by Hurricane Ivan in, 20, in 2004. We have Mark Taylor, former head of the Caribbean School of Architects as well. And Mark went and he looked at the urban, urban project. He looked at housing and urban in one of our downtown areas. And this is one of the projects that he, he worked on as, as a Caribbean person. Now, Brian Camacho remembers that Zaha Hadid had invited him to work in her firm. But he chose to stay in the Caribbean. And this is one of the buildings that he's done. Although he's from Ghana and Trinidad, this is a project he did in St. Lucia. Audley. Now we just love Audley because when we went to um, London, we thought we were the only Caribbean people there. But there was Audley. He's a, he's a wind rush and we celebrate wind rush. This is the month of celebrating wind rush. So he's a wind rush gen and he's doing net zero building and sending it into the Caribbean. And so we have Audley who started in 1974. And so we go to uh, Christopher. And we recognize that Christopher also is one of our lecturers at the Caribbean School of Architecture, Shaw. And Christopher Shaw has done this building, which is lead um, gold certificate pending and in Kingston. Then we go on to Stephen Jameson. Stephen Jameson is currently one of the full-time members of the Caribbean School of Architecture. And he's worked in Trinidad for a number of years. And this is one of his projects. Notice the modernism, but it still has all the elements of Caribbeanism, shading devices, and um, all these, these elements that relate to tropicalism, hot, humid tropicalism. And so the late Roger Tur Turton um, has done this intricate housing development in a hillside with all the various challenges. Uh, Mark Roman remembers him as quite a talented architect. And so we go to Mark Raymond, who is now the Dean of the graduate program at the University of Johannesburg. He's, a, I saw he entered and um, now living in South Africa. Thank you, Mark, for being here. And so we see his work also, modernism still with elements of tropicalism. And Leonard, Sean Leonard, who is, I remember when being at the AA in 1972, we had lots of of elements like this on the roof, and we were doing tensile structures and so on. So that forms part of the modernism. Finally, I sh showcase Karen here. Karen, Karen, Karen um, Hay actually went after the, she was the last person who started at the AA in 1987. The Caribbean School of Architecture started in 1988. And so we have Karen Karen, and this is one of her projects, fabulous refurbishing projects that she has done for the, B, the business processing outsourcing. And I would like to say, as I find the cursor to move to the next slide, <laughs> which is my final slide. Yes, there you go. 
I want to say thank you. In preparing this presentation, there are I have recognized that there are a number of books which speaks to tropicalism. Um, the Institute, Instituto de Arquitectura Tropical in Costa Rica still exists. And one of the outproducts of this is a book on tropical architecture. But what is interesting in doing this research is that the books that speak to Otto Konigsberg and Jane Drew, Max and Fry, speak about Africa, speak about India, but there is such a gap on the work of the Caribbean and the work of Caribbean architects and the influence of Caribbean architects who have gone through the AA training on tropical, in tropical architecture and have graduated and returned not only to build, but also to educate and having a local, regional and global impact. I thank you so much. I hope this stimulates discussion and looking forward to the rest of the, the sessions. Thank you all. Patricia, that was such a, an inspiring and thought-provoking talk. Um, and you showed us such a wealth of projects and personalities that really connect the AA to the Caribbean um, and like show us like, I guess, the whole new side of tropical modernism. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm, I think it was a great way to, to set the scene for the conversations to follow. Um, on a personal note, I also really enjoyed reading your interview on the AA website that discussed your kind of incredible career spanning your experience from studying at the AA in the 70s and how it sparked your interest in working with communities and your subsequent research into modernism and the kind of important preservation work you did. So I encourage everyone to read it if they haven't yet, and maybe we can post a link in the chat. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so I guess to move now to our first panel on urban development and the sustainable growth of cities, um, where we're joined from speakers from Haiti, Mexico, Colombia, the Dominican Republic, and Trinidad and Tobago to give us different perspectives on this topic from literally all corners of the Caribbean, um, which I'm very excited to hear more about. Um, I'm going to just briefly introduce uh, the different speakers before handing over to them to present. And starting with Isabel Jolicoeur, who's an architect and co-founder of the architecture firm Ateliers CoLab. Uh, in 2015, she founded Atypic, a platform that acts both as a virtual showcase on Haitian creativity, but also as an incubator of formative and inspiring initiatives for professionals as well as the general public. She also teaches at Kiskea University and within an Urban Resiliency Master's program at the State University, UEH, in collaboration with the University of Liège and the University of Mons in Belgium. Through her many roles, she aims to promote architecture and creativity in general as an essential tool in shaping a sustainable society. Then we have Adrian Aguirre, uh, a director of, different, uh, of a very different AA to the Architectural Association, um, but rather his uh, self-named practice that focuses on architecture and design. And since 2017, uh, is a researcher and architecture design tutor at ITESM. Adrian's approach towards architecture focuses on speculation-based digital and analog fabrication, aiming to establish a new architectural paradigm where spaces have been replaced by heterogeneous fields of interaction, creating adaptable, flexible, and evolutionary systems, which he has explored through his teaching practice and publications, including Accidental Architecture in 2016. Uh, he's an AA alumnus graduating from the AADRL in 2012. Uh, then we have Brian Lewis, who studied at the AA qualifying as an architect in 1970, as we heard from Patricia's presentation, before returning to Trinidad and Tobago to work as an architect, culminating in his role as practice manager of ACLA Architecture. Um, he's worked on major projects such as the financial complex of Trinidad and Tobago, the university there, the Gulf City complex, and the British Gas headquarters in Port of Spain. After retiring, Brian has become an architectural photographer and has published his photographs in the book Com Contemporary Caribbean Architecture and has an upcoming book on the capital city of Trinidad titled Port of Spain, an Architectural Record. Uh, Brian's also served as president of the Trinidad and Tobago Institute of Architects, president of the Joint Consultative Council of Trinidad and Tobago, and a member of the Interim Physical National Commission, among others. 
Then we have Jenny Nieto, who's an architect who has participated in designs for public space and public buildings since the beginning of her career through projects that have had an important impact on the transformation of Colombian cities. From 2012 to 2017, she was a consultant for the public space department at the planning office. And since 2012, she's also been a director of her own practice, Nero Architectura, where she works with the public and private sectors, offering consultancy services to other offices, especially in public space and also around advanced geometry for structures. She's also taught for eight years at the Javier Anna University and currently is doing a master's degree in landscape design. And she's also an A alumna of the Emergent Technologies and Design Program. And finally, Harry Urania is an architect and also an A alumnus graduating in 1979. He now lives and works in the Dominican Republic as an architect and director of his own studio, DAS, with his wife, who was locally trained in the Dominican Republic. And will, he will tell us more in the discussion to follow. So um, the panel will begin with two short presentations by Isabel and Adrian. And then we'll be followed by a longer discussion uh, involving Brian, Jenny, and Harry. And um, I guess they will also respond to the presentations and incorporate their own expertise um, in that. And if you have any questions throughout the session, please feel free to post them in the chat so I can ask them in the discussion portion of the session as, um, as part of the conversation. So Isabel, shall I hand over to you to go first? Okay, I was having trouble unmuting myself. Okay, yes, thank you very much. So I can go on, I can share my screen. Does everyone see my screen? Yes. Yes, perfect, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Isabel Alice Jolicoeur. I'm an architect currently working in Haiti. I'm Haitian. Um, I was born in Haiti. Um, I obtained my license and then my master's in Montreal. I worked there for a couple of years, for eight years. And then I came back to Haiti. Um, in 2015, I founded Atypic, a platform I will talk about more in a few minutes. Um, I also teach in two different universities in Haiti, um, something I really enjoy. Um, and I share a passion with all these commitments. I share the same mission and passion, which is to promote um, architecture and creativity in general um, and prove that somehow it's an, an essential tool in shaping a sustainable society for us um, in general, but also in Haiti. In today's presentation, I will be talking about sustainability and resiliency in architecture, but also the role of architects um, into the making of the sustainability. Um, so I'll just go along with it. So between the 90s and 2008, the Caribbean suffered 165 disasters. Some have been forgotten and some have marked the collective memory through the impact they've had on our lives. So we remember Idzit in Martinique, uh, the earthquake in Haiti that all, I guess everyone knows about, or the eruption of the Soufrière in, in 1979. One thing is certain is that natural hazards make intrinsic part of our Caribbean lives um, with its 30 territories, 700 islands and 43 million inhabitants. The population of the Caribbean, even though they know different stories, share the same harsh climatic conditions. There are three main risks in the Caribbean, which are three of the worst types of natural hazards, hurricanes, um, earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Almost all major cities of the region have been devastated over the past 300 years by at least one natural disaster. Of course, the torrential rains can also be considered as natural risks since they occur as a consequence of the frequency of hurricanes and often result in flooding and landslides. As we are currently in the cyclonic season, which runs from, I believe, the 1st of June through um, the end of November, um, Haiti is no stranger to disasters. Haiti is subject to two of the three um, major natural risks I just mentioned, hurricanes, which happen mostly in the south of the country, and earthquakes. The most sadly known to, to date is the one of um, January 12, 2010. All of this combined with the fact that 80% of the population that lives um, in coastal areas has the consequence of exposing the inhabitants from these regions to a set of disasters, more or less predictable and recurring year round. 
If natural hazards are constant in our lives, how were these threats handled in the past? What about today? And most importantly, how will our children and their children handle them in the future? One of the best examples of resilient architecture in Haiti are the gingerbread. The gingerbread is an architectural style that is characterized by high doors, elaborate wooden patterns, and wrought iron. The term gingerbread was coined by American tourists in the 50s that came to visit Haiti and compared the style to the Victorian um, style of the United States. Gingerbread presents a very distinct, distinct aesthetic style, but one of its interesting aspects is its ability to adapt the Victorian style to Caribbean climatic conditions, and more particularly climatic conditions specific to Haiti. Here you can see um, on the slide, the recently renovated Maison du Faux in Port-au-Prince. These houses in wooden structure or masonry also have several characteristics that allow them to adapt to our climate. For example, they are equipped with heavy shutters on the windows that they can be closed quickly in case of rain showers, tropical storm or hurricane. They also have sloping roofs allowing rainwater to run off easily um, during frequent wind showers. But what about today? How are last lifestyles affected by natural hazards? The first observations that we can make um, for the time present today and not the past is that there is a before and there's an after um, disaster time. The trend, for example, before January 12 was the overuse of concrete as a reliable modern uh, material in times of hurricane. After January 12, the trend reversed for a predilection for sheet metal, which performs um, um, well against earthquakes, but not well against hurricanes. And so the, the cycles repeats themselves without any real resolution or prevention of these hazards. Post-disaster cycles range from life-threatening um, emergency to a transitional time, which are repeated from disaster to disaster without a real progress and without really going beyond these two moments. The timing of structuring project, if we, if we will say like it like that, is shown in dotted lines due political um, instability. The most striking example of the impact of a natural hazard in Haiti, of course, is that of 2010 with the magnitude 7.2 earthquake um, that struck the capital and which led to the death of over 200,000 people. And yet, a month later in Chile, with an earthquake of 8.8 .8 magnitude, there were only 700 casualties. What is the difference? First, there is almost no construction standards in Haiti, but also there is a crisis in the transmission of our know-how or knowledge. Many gingerbread houses, the, the house I just shown before, have suffered important damages following the, that earthquake, However, this type of traditional construction has proven to be particularly able to absorb seismic shock and therefore, um, and therefore are particularly able to absorb the, the seismic shock and therefore are the ones that, that did not collapse. Century old buildings proved to be more efficient and resilient than buildings that were built in the last 10 or 20 years. Why? What happened to our ways of transmitting our construction knowledge or construction know-how between the years um, 1800, the year of the gingerbreads, and, and January 12th? And what is the architect's responsibility in the transmission of this knowledge is the question that I'm asking myself. So the question that we ask ourselves is what is the place of the architect today in building our resilient societies knowing that know-how should be an essential working tool. Where does the architect come in and how? We chose to um, analyze the question through three skills, um, the building, the city, and the, the territory. First of the building. In Haiti, 74% of the urban population lives in slums. We can then assume that 74% of the population do not directly use an architect and do not have the means to, to do so. Because of course, there is a poverty that has a big role into the building mechanism of the population. By comparing the loss of life during disaster to the GPD of these communities, we quickly see that the poor populations and community are disproportionately affected by natural hazards. It is important to, to, to take into 
into account the complex social phenomena, such as limited resources, which forces people to settle in areas that are at risk, that puts them at risk and exposes them um, constantly to uh, a situation of vulner vulnerability, and which also obliges them to practice largely self-construction and not have the means to use an architect to proceed in an archaic way, so with bad materials, bad construction technique, and so on. In short, poverty increases our vulnerability to natural disasters, and this dimension is for the most part beyond the control of the architect um, working in Haiti and outside of his or her sphere of influence. Next up, the city. The city is made up of multiple actors. We have the architects or, or us um, and other planning professional, um, but we also have politicians who set the policies, the public policies and um, rules and the framework for urban development, the private sector, which invests in the city based on interests um, that differs from, from a person to another, urban operators who implements the, the projects, the academic sector who does research and analyze the issues, the associative sector which defends the interests of groups in the community, and of course, the citizens at the end of the day who live in the city. Often, Amongst all these actors, the architects may find himself or herself alone defending the basic principles of um, the importance of architecture uh, in the making of resiliency to which the other actors are often not made aware of. And finally, the territory. Today, there are around, in Haiti, there are around 300 officially recognized um, architects for around 10 to 12 million inhabitants. This is a ratio of one architects for over 35,000 people compared, for example, to Martinique, which is a neighboring, neighbor, neighboring island, um, which has a ratio of one architect for two, about 200, um, people. The numerical disadvantage for architects in the national territory is impressive. It is the result mainly of the brain drain in Haiti which affects um, around 80% of professionals that possess a post-secondary education that go elsewhere to practice architecture, for example. So um, I'm part of the 20% the that chose to stay and still chooses to stay, but also the insufficient number of new young people trained in the profession as architects. This picture of the situation at these three scales, so the city, the building, and the territory may appear a little gloomy um, in the complex social economic context of Haiti, but I believe there's hope. What if the intervention of the architect had to go beyond the normal cycle of building, which is um, conceptualizing, constructing, and using, beyond the post-disaster reactionary situation we always find ourselves in? What if we were to participate in a social transformation that would span several generations? With architects like Alejandro Aravena, we redefine architecture as no longer as a service to the elite, but as a service to the community in general. It's the end of us to architects. Oscar Namaya said that the architects must create today the past of tomorrow. And I believe that he's right. And I would add that it should go beyond the simple framework of the, of the project and a client's order for a project, for example, and that the architect should have the obligation to invest socially into the community. One of the actions that can be, that can be taken is to increase its presence in the three scales that I mentioned, um, the territory, the city, and the building. The city, the architect should take more place in decision of the modeling of the city guide national and local policies in terms of urban development, for example, carry out advocacy actions to take into account the urban issues specific to Haiti with institutions national and international. Um, in the scale of the building, the architect should help change building habits and change um, building culture um, that are both not currently resilient. Um, in the scale of the territory by helping to train the workforce to train the new generation of architects by teaching, for example, um, therefore by engaging in education, but also by ensuring its own continuing training. But where do we start? The task at hand may seem titanic, 
impossible even. Um, in, 18, in the 1800s, three young Haitians went to Paris to study architecture and returned to Haiti and created what I've shown you has, has been named the, the gingerbread style, which is a clever mix of foreign technique and local knowledge. We now know that gingerbread houses have mainly been created for elites, although other more modest buildings were designed according to the same principle, thanks to the oral transmission of traditional craftsmanship. But oral tradition is no longer enough. And our resilient traditional know-how struggles to spread to the new generation. How to get the, social, the architect socially involved and broaden its influence and the dissemination of its knowledge. A first answer could be technology, mainly the internet. In Haiti, there are over 6 million people who own a, a cell phone and internet is more and more accessible. The internet could be the media tool that could be used as a vector of change and amplification of the message of the architect in the three spheres that I've mentioned, the territory, the city, and the building. In 2015, I created Atypic, um, which is a platform that acts both as a virtual showcase um, for Haitian architecture, but also as an incubator for formative and insp inspiring initiatives, conferences, workshops, etc., for professionals, but not only for professionals, but also, also the general public. The platform allows students and professionals alike to publish their projects um, on the website and ideas to other professionals or students or the general public. The idea behind the platform was to um, democratize access to information regarding architecture um, for everything related to crowdsourcing architecture, like just like Wikipedia, which grows with contributions um, from members of its own community and which up, up ultimately benefits everyone. The internet makes it possible to create a virtual link um, between worker and architect, theory and practice, but also create bridges between generations that don't um, really speak to each other um, in, the, in, the, in the day to day. A few years later, we have hundreds of publications with projects from countries around, around the world. Since after the earthquake, a lot of um, practices and a lot of university came to Haiti to, um, to do architecture. The platform also allowed us to go beyond our borders and our ge geographical areas. For example, by creating links with organizations from Martinique or from the UK, such as the AA. Um, what at first should have been just a digital library of projects that stays on a website became so much more. Through Atypic, with a passionate team of architects, but also engineers, without funds, with just a website and just some um, networking, we started to create unifying events around themes related to architecture, to talk more about architecture and its importance into the making of a resilient city. Um, and these, these events acted as avenues for reflections on how each of us can be socially involved and influence all the spheres that orbit around the, the architect. In 2015, Atsipik became par partner with um, the AA Visiting School with a workshop that was led by John Naylor. Hi, John. Thanks for inviting me to, to speak today. Um, the workshop took place once a year and focused mainly on the use of bamboo in parametric design of buildings. The workshop was open to everyone, local and international students, and proposed to explore different ways of, of assembling bamboo with advanced software like Rhino, and then test these models at a scale of one-to-one -one, um, with the participants locally here in Haiti. Um, we all know that we all know, I'm telling you, the material of choice in Haiti is concrete mainly, which is used in 80% of constructions. So it was interesting to use a different material like bamboo. Bamboo, bamboo is a versatile material of, on many skills um, from architecture to land restoration. It is a material that is very relevant to the cultural, ecological and climatic context in Haiti. It is renewable, parasismic, parasitonic, and ecological. Um, bamboo seems to be the idea, ideal material, but it also a material that is very little known to the public here in Haiti. In the context of a large, largely self-constructed population, um, research and practice of 
workshops like this one, the one that was led by John, um, are extremely relevant. They allow not only to promote research in the academic environment of new building materials, but also to introduce um, responsible and sustainable materials in the construction culture and encourage good self-building practices. And finally, to train a new type of workforce and a new generation of architects inclined to use new ecological materials. The man that is showing that image um, to the right, um, I got to know him through that workshop. He still uses bamboo in his project and he, he learned bamboo through that workshop um, specifically, which is interesting. Um, it has always al already been determined that in the context of informal construction, inadequate materials and the lack of construction standards um, block population in a constant situation of vulnerability um, with a greater vari variety of resilient materials such as bamboo um, available. It is possible that the po population can be educated in their use. It is possible to reinvent and redo entirely our culture of construction without using over and over concrete. And the architect can invest in it by being part of seeking new materials, teaching this knowledge of construction techniques. And as tutor in that workshop um, that was led by John, um, like the visiting school did. The one of one of the other goals of ATIPIC is also to promote the resilient buildings that we already have to ge the general public. So that our project ultimately acts as um, reference models that fulfill much more than their primary functions, but also that serve as communication tools and become vectors of change. And so we also organize immersive site visits of existing projects. Here we see um, the pictures of a site visit of the reconstruction of a gingerbread house, which is the Maison Chenet um, in Port-au-Prince. These visits are carried out in partnership with Focal, um, which is an organization which has set up a program to renovate gingerbread houses. Um, practical tech training and theoretical courses are provided in the field to craftsmen. This is the principle of the workshop school, so atelier école. So they, it's it's as much a school learning um, medium as a workshop, and therefore the the renovation of these houses is also a learning opportunity by making it possible to train a new expert workforce. This kind of citizen awareness, if you will, activity makes it possible to popularize architecture and educate the general public about the importance of the quality of the built environment, but also to change the general culture in relation to architecture. If citizens understand better the importance of good design or the standard, standardization of construction, in turn, they will be able to put pressure on their representatives in public spheres and demand that public procurement improve or that laws, laws on spatial planning be passed, et cetera. Each of us can help raise public awareness um, of the challenges of sustainable planning and construction. So our building can serve as a communication tool and have a larger footprint than their physical presence by communicating the ideas, principle, and know-how, that know-how that we're losing so much that made them possible. And lastly, the, the most difficult sphere to reach is that of the city after the territory and the building. It's the city, the political and decision-making actors were often not aware of um, the challenges of development issues in architecture. Um, one of the most important workshops at CIPIC organized was one about the sidewalks in Porto Pines, um, where we invited everyone from st students to professionals, to lawmakers, to politicians, to be part of that workshops. Um, this topic concerns the general public, but depends mainly on development of municipal management. It was the opportunity to create a multidisciplinary workshop open to everyone and the opportunity to put in the same space those people to talk about an issue that affects everyone. Um, the, the idea is that by raising awareness and educating those involved in the city directly in the town halls, um, they turn into allies 
by including them in our conversation or architectural conversations and by getting involved in their conversations and understanding the, the struggles and the challenges they face every day in their work. Um, it's also an opportunity to make our architecture community more visible and to consolidate them. Um, oftentimes in Haiti, the, the architecture committee is not visible enough and not speaking loudly enough. So getting involved allows us to forge links between our communities, but above all to strengthen their power of action so that they can turn, um, they can in turn take action by lobbying, for example. We do not have an uh, architecture community in Haiti that has the power as, or the, the, the strength to lobby. Um, for example, in Quebec, the Order of Architect has been campaigning since 2014 and recently obtained um, a national architecture policy um, by organizing consultation and public workshops um, during which professionals and citizens are, were invited to contribute. Many countries have already have a national policy of architecture. In Haiti, we have not yet had that, but yeah, I'm hopeful. This kind of policy makes it possible to adopt common vision in order to harmonize laws and regulations and to ensure that the construction and, and development of the territory respond in the long term to the challenges of today, but also of tomorrow. Involving the public sphere allows us to improve public order to pass decisive laws for risk prevention, land use planning, zoning, et cetera, and the application of, of course, construction standards. And in the end, these three types of actions, combined actions, are avenues for reflection to launch the debate and raise the question of our resilience as a professional, as architects. Raising the awareness of all layers of society to the importance of architecture and planning in the management of our territory is, is essential. It will allow us to create a new generation that is conscious of the challenges that we face, will in turn become our lawmakers or ministers or presidents, etc., in order to bring about a lasting social transformation as much as the natural risk we face in as a community. So instead of asking ourselves how to create resilient, sustainable architectures, let us ask ourselves how to create resilient, sustainable architects. Um, I would finally like to add that um, I spoke mainly about natural risks, but that Haiti is currently experiencing an unprecedented moment of social and politi political crisis. Um, the Haitian city in itself is currently living a race towards building for the long term to guarantee the security of goods and people in the face of riots, attacks, and a general context of insecurity. But this race is direct in, the, in direct contradiction with the many other vulnerabilities that we face year round on the national territory that I mentioned, such as floods, earthquakes, hurricane, et cetera. So we have a multiplicity, if you will, of vulnerabilities, which are um, both human-made and natural. So it's not lost on us as architects that architects need not only to address resiliency and sustainability through the scope of natural risk, but also human-made risk, such as the insecurity we're currently living. And we must be aware of the multiplicity of this risk to which we are exposed in order to be able to address them systemically, systemically and not periodically, one after the other, which is what we're doing right now. Thank you for listening. Sorry for my accent. <laughs> I hope everyone understood well. Thank you so much, Isabel. It was terrific. And um, I think there's lots of questions that I'd like to return to in the discussion. Um, but I guess I'll pass over to Adrian um, to the next presentation first. Perfect. Thank you. OK, hello. Uh, first of all, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for inviting me to this forum again. Um, so I'm going to start. You can see all pink in the screen. OK, so regarding urban development and sustainable growth in Mexico, 
I will present you a projection into our future. Uh, rather than displaying uh, the classic image of the classical of the urban landscape in Mexico City, where the green spaces and greenscape has been displaced by the grayscape, leaving no space for mountain trees or valleys. So initial projections uh, will span over a 90-year period. Uh, data from 2010 to 2020 was used as a reference for the next 80 years. Considering a global reality, Mexico can be understood without the complexity of its relationship with USA, Central America, and the Caribbean. In a sense, uh, the DIMAXION map, along its values promoted by Mr. Fuller, uh, highlights how these relationships exist and how they should be fostered, uh, a borderless, apolitical, and continuous territory that can be understood based on suitable health system, public education programs, equality, e economic growth, immediate action to fight against climate change and preservation of oceans and forests amongst other agendas. The system to understand uh, sustainable growth requires an understanding of Mexico and its territory through these projections uh, related to the data that I mentioned. So from 2010 to 2100, you will see from top to right to left, total population, number of mega cities in the territory, which corresponds to cities with more than 10 million inhabitants, uh, a world rank in gross domestic product, percentage in population living in urban areas, and carbon emissions to the atmosphere. So in 2010, Mexico had 114 million inhabitants. With one megacity, you know it, Mexico City, uh, we were ranked 15 uh, in GDP and emitted a total of 478 kilotons of carbon dioxide. It doesn't sound as bad, considering that Mexico uh, contributed with only 1.28% of the total global emissions. However, we are the most polluting country in Latin America. By 2030, we will keep growing in all aspects. Population will reach 137 million inhabitants with one mega city, and we will be ranked between ninth and 16th in GDP. Uh, and we will increment uh, to 660,000 kilotons of carbon dioxide. Uh, but, but with the, committed, the commitment to reduce at least one third of those emissions according to the Paris Agreement signed in 2015. So if we follow the policies that we agreed, Mexico will reach its emissions peak by 2025 or 2026, and then emissions will drop. However, actions taken so far, according to the data, seem insufficient to achieve those goals. By 2050, we will grow steadily with a population of 148 million inhabitants, uh, three mega, one to three mega cities, probably joining Guadalajara and Monterrey. Uh, rank, we will rank fifth to 14 in GDP, and at least two thirds of our entire population will be living in cities. Carbon emissions will increase up to a level where we, if even we accomplish all the climate change commitments, will rise. As a reference, in 2050, we will emit the same amount of carbon dioxide by uh, that China currently is. And finally, by 2100, population will decline to level seen by 2040. Uh, Mexican population will reach its peak around 2060 and will decline steadily due to aging in population along high mortality and low natality rates. Three major cities will stay and uh, GDP will drop to its lower rank projection down to 15 to, 25, to 21st. And we will reach a maximum of carbon dioxide or four, or, or four times the current of China emissions. So you may wonder, and I wonder, how these, a couple of these data look in our territory. So population and pollution. 
In the Mexican territory, uh, population distribution will focus at the center of the country and will expand towards the west coast. So consider Mexico City, the state of Mexico, San Luis Potosí, Guanajuato, Michoacán, and Jalisco, adding up a couple of uh, cities uh, in the north, Nuevo León and Coahuila. And finally, two border states along their friendly neighbors, I would say, California, and uh, Baja California, and Ciudad, uh, and um, Chihuahua and Texas. So if I convert these to cities, it will be like a mega city between Tijuana and San Diego and Ciudad Juarez and El Paso. Pollution will be distributed mainly towards the central region of the West Coast, Jalisco, Michoacán, and state of Mexico, and up north, Baja California and California. So for a sustainable uh, future, then I focus again on, on the 2010 reality and then the 2030 to, and 2050 projections. From top and then uh, clockwise, you will see uh, farming and agriculture need uh, according to uh, the need uh, per inhabitant, households, preservation of natural resources, a health system based on number of doctors, nurses, and number of beds per inhabitant needed, an education system based on level of studies, uh, waste treatment or recycle, uh, carbon dioxide emissions, and urban and rural land. So pink represents current and real data. Dark pink, dark pink represents projections by government or other uh, agencies. And brown represents the ideal according to global standards or uh, study cases happening worldwide. By 2010, uh, we had less, 50, less than 50% of the total uh, areas required for our population for agriculture or farming. We were 50% short on housing needs and we were below acceptable levels on health system and our education level averages Elementary school, while we recycle only 8% of the total waste produced. By 2030, numbers don't seem to improve health, education, waste management, carbon dioxide emissions, and usage, usage of land. However, housing will meet barely the necessity without considering the dignity of those houses. By 2050, Carbon dioxide emissions will be above 100% of global standards. Waste management will be below 70% of those global standards as well. So in numbers, just to give you like a hint, uh, where we stand in, in relation to Latin America. Uh, we are number one in health system, but you have seen the numbers. We're number two in GDP, just behind Brazil. And we are number four in education. But at the same time, Mexico is number one in CO2 emissions. We're number one in waste generation, number four in poverty, and number eight in inequity. So take your deductions. Along with this dismal data and projections, I will conclude through a conceptualization that we developed in 2018 named Delirious Landscape. Nature has proven that determinism of morphologies is not rigorous and that the same variation can produce diverse outcomes. Morphologies are not absolute. Cities are in continuous evolution. Architecture as key instrument to represent evolution aims to adapt and adjust to conditions of chaos, harmony, disruption, conjunction, and human essence, eradicating a centralized city has that. Mexico will face great challenges in the future, but the outcome of the next 10 years will affect its territory. Collaboration and connectivity to the Latin American region might be the key for a post-human era of radical materialization in urbanism and architectural spaces. So finally, but not the least, uh, I want to acknowledge people who made this possible or helped me 
for the presentation. So thank you, Regina, Samantha, Jorge, and Drew. And thank you all on the other side of the screen. Thank you very much, Adrian. And um, I, that was like a really incredible um, set of, of, of data, both real and I guess speculative, um, really highlighting kind of urgent issues that need to be addressed. Um, so I guess uh, after those two really fascinating presentations, it would be great to, to open up the conversation and also um, to include the rest of our panelists, um, Jenny, Brian, um, Harry, as well um, to talk to to respond to what you've presented, um, I think uh, Jenny uh, had like her connection cut off, so we we might need to Ben if it's possible to make her a co-host again. That would be great. Um, and uh, but in the meantime, I think maybe one of the questions I wanted to start with was something that Isabel raised in her presentation about the role of the architect. Um, and to hear what each of you thought about that, especially given that you come from different contexts within the Caribbean, like how you see the role of the architect evolving going forward to address uh, these multiple and often intersectional crises, um, but also that uh, to, to bring different people around the same table to, to, to not keep these the solutions to them or the strategies to deal with them kind of within architecture, but make it a more interdisciplinary conversation. So, um, yeah, I don't know if, if any of you want to respond to that and to use examples from your work. Uh, if I may, yes, being please. probably the oldest amongst those who are participating, um, I started very much in the line of Isabel. I was a very uh, romantic, uh, very focused on uh, trying to adapt architecture to what it should be. Uh, I worked my first few years in the, Domin uh, in the Dominican Republic, having come, in, come back from, from the UK in an institution that was for, uh, put together in order to uh, do uh, and define energy policies. I was brought on to the, 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 the group of uh, the work group because of my work in, uh, at the AA with Simos Yanas in, in the graduate school. And my technical dissertation was to do with the use of natural resources uh, in architecture. What I have found that of all the work that we did in that institution, it lacked political backing because of political uh, ignorance. So, uh, that is one of the issues that has to be uh, taken into account in all the things that have been said by uh, the, 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 those that have pre uh, predecessed me, that they, they came before me. Education, uh, not only of the art, but education as a whole. Um, the Caribbean, uh, it was nice to hear, uh, to have Pat include me, but be, we as a nation, the Dominicans and probably the Puerto Ricans, I think there's a Puerto Rican with us in, the, in, in, the, in this, in, in this uh, chat. Uh, we have not traditionally Cuban, Dominican Republic and Puerto Rico have not traditionally been included in the Caribbean. Caribbean, especially in the UK, was meant for the Caribbean that was, that was uh, colonized by the UK, Jamaica, by the UK and European countries, Jamaica, Haiti, and all the islands. The larger islands have, uh, are very different. Uh, 
we at the beginning, uh, the Dominican Hispaniola, which is where Dominican Republic and Haiti uh, are, uh, was the first land to be discovered. It was in the eight, late 1500s, uh, 1400s, and uh, the first settlement, organized settlement in the New World was in fact the city of Santo Domingo. From here, the all we are probably, uh, together with the Spaniards, are responsible for all, all the other discoveries. We, I say, because uh, the, we, it, they all li uh, started off from here, way back in, in the early 1500s. Uh, obviously, this is a small island, and uh, the riches that they were expecting to to find were not found. And so the continent, you know, Mexico, Colombia, Venezuela, all took over the importance. And so we've had different periods of, uh, of development. In the late, the late history, uh, those three countries that I've mentioned, uh, I will exclude Cuba, First of all, because I don't know much about it, but also because Cuba has uh, has been isolated from the development uh, in the area. But Puerto Rico and the Dominican Republic have followed uh, development uh, guidelines set by in the international world in a way. They, we have this Santo Domingo all of a sudden was a is and has become a very uh, very chaotic city uh, uh, full of cars that uh, we have no room for and in terms of uh, of, of architecture full of buildings clad by in in glass totally inadequately. Uh, opposed to what we should be doing as a tropical island. But that only teaches us that the architecture often or more than often re responds to the economical development of the cities, of all the countries. Uh, we have... Uh, to take into account earthquakes and hurricanes. In fact, we're waiting the first tropical storm this weekend uh, for the season. And But we do not, most of our buildings are not uh, incli with inclined uh, uh, roofing. Most of our buildings, especially in the cities, are flat roof because in the early, 50s, the international, Le Corbusier, the international architecture had a lot of influence in the Dominican Republic and it became almost a norm. And uh, so all the uh, 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 all the architecture, traditional architecture, Victorian architecture, began to be put aside and uh, Change exchange for modern and uh, and uh, sturdy buildings. This also was a result that in 1930, the Santo Domingo was almost devastated, totally, totally, because of a hurricane that went right through it. As opposed, in 79, we had a similar uh, hurricane, but the city restored itself within, within a week, 10 days, because of all the use of, uh, of the reinforced concrete. And uh, the, we do have tradition, the Spanish tradition of straight, the, the, the quadricular the, uh, road developments. Uh, we ha had a long time ago, there, it's you no. Know, Small, uh, little by little disappearing, a lot of 
uh, trees in the in in the main roads, especially. But that tradition has is you no, know, it's becoming is is being lost more and more. Uh, I think that uh, we have a a lot of work to do in terms of uh, trying to get the city back to be to human scale. The the car the vehicular scale has uh, has taken over and is pro prominent in most of our cities. Santo Domingo houses about forty. Five fifty percent of our uh, of our population, which is around between ten and twelve million, uh, and so it, it means that the, a lot of uh, a lot of cars have to to move the it and it it was developed it developed horizontally, which means that there's also transportation that has to be sorted out. Public transportation is very poor, and so public People uh, prefer to buy a car in order to to transport themselves from one place to another. Especially now in the pandemic, it's got worse because people don't want to share public transport. They want to go on their own so that they can be safe from whatever. Uh, I would like to uh, just before I because I didn't I didn't mean this to be very long anyway. I didn't prepare. A, a a speech or anything like that, but there is something that is uh, there's an element that was not mentioned by by Adrian, especially because probably he in Mexico is this not not going to be a, a big problem, but water is and will be the main problem in the future development. So uh, that we need to to look at as well. I think I will give my uh, I will pass on to to the others to comment and further discussion. Thanks. Um, I think Jenny has her hand raised. So Jenny, over to you. Hi. Um, yeah. Uh, according to the two presentations, uh, I would like to say like uh, a bit of our context in Colombia. Uh, I guess maybe you know we have a. Uh, a country that has two oceans, Atlantic, Pacific, uh, but our main cities are in, in, in uh, say, inside the country, right? Like uh, within mountain chains. Um, and our cities, all our main cities, like Cali, Medellin, Bogota, um, even Barranquilla, we have two things in common, and it, they have uh, mountains and, and rivers crossing. Uh, the growth of our cities have uh, destroyed the rivers, and now all of our cities are going into uh, um, into a de developing new infrastructure to protect the rivers and to make the people come back to the to the rivers. Uh, and this. Uh, if we take it into the conversation, um, it, it's been an effort to do it in a, let's, let's say, in a landscape uh, into not so concrete projects, right? Um, but we do have a challenge to start working in public infrastructure, uh, very connected with the, uh, with resilience and with um, uh, with becoming more nature cities, not so um, not so uh, so built, uh, we do we do have that in the inner cities. But in the Caribbean cities, as uh, Cartagena, Barran uh, Barranquilla, and recently we do have the experience in uh, in uh, Providencia and San Andres. We did have the Iota Huracan. Uh, we experienced the lack of regulations, uh, as Isabel was saying. Um, the regulations are behind. They they are all behind. They're not. They're coming like um, after the disaster, and 
coming into the discussion of what is the role of our architects and AA architects is that I do think we have the potential to do hurricane simulations, uh, earthquake simulations. We do have the, the power to uh, come with the strategies, um, previous strategies, not, not after the disaster. And we have so many information, we have so many projects, so much value in our AA project, um, but it, it, it stays uh, in a website or it stays in a, an exhibition. And it, doesn't not, it does not connect with regulations or policies in our countries. It, it, it should be our, uh, our, uh, our task to connect the power of academy with regulations to prevent and not only to then come out with a nice project. So I think that was my, my approach also as Enrique, you said, I didn't prepare, but I hope I, I send the message. Thank you, Jenny. No, that was really clear. And um, I think it's an important point to make. Um, I, I guess, um, Brian, can I bring you in here to, to, to also comment? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the AA, and particularly Pat and, and all of you, really, for putting on this amazing event. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to correct an Enrique Lowe. I, I doubt you are the oldest person here. I'm sorry, I must disagree with you. <laughs> but anyway. Um, I'd like to I'd like to really congratulate the, the two presenters. I thought they they presented very professional presentations, perhaps with too much information to absorb in a short time. But still, what really impressed me is um, how they focused on very serious issues, not so much the traditional architectural perspective, but survival issues, really. And I wondered to myself, I mean, in Trinidad, where I'm from, we are fortunate we don't really have such, such a serious um, state of affairs. Um, perhaps I have had blinkers on <laughs> or something, but um, we, we practice very much as in the traditional form of architecture and um, so it's quite, it's quite a, a, a surprise for me. Uh, let me see, I made one or two other little notes here. But I don't know how that will affect the education of architecture to preparing people, architects to, to work in quite different local issues. In other words, to prepare architects to, to perform as in the traditional form, or whether they have to be much more active in their communities to deal with more serious survival issues and, and of the future as well. I mean, clearly the environment is now the big issue, right? So, which is not something we were, in my day in, in 1970 or 65 or whatever, we were not really taught much about that, um, although it was, it was passive in a sense. Um, so I would just like to end really by congratulating everybody. I, I would have liked to have seen some buildings along the way. <laughs> but anyway, um, I guess the, the, the fact is things are right, quite serious in certain parts of the world. And architects must adapt to dealing with these circumstances. So I thank you for asking me to say a few words um, and, and press on. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Brian. Um, so I just also wanted to remind everybody that if you have a question, you can post it in the chat um, and I can ask it on your behalf. Or if you want to contribute uh, verbally, just raise your hand and we can unmute you. Um, but in the meantime, I don't know, um, Adrian and Isabel, if you wanted to add anything further in response to uh, the different contributions um, that your fellow panelists have now made in response to your presentations. Or otherwise, um, 
I have another no, question. Sure. Oh, Why not? Go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, I was listening to Enrique and he's right. I think one of the main issues, obviously, uh, amongst the number of inhabitants, uh, the pollution in Mexico is water, right? And water is triggered by not um, allowing a system that uh, it's uh, captating all the water from natural resources or rain, right? We we I just recently experienced a like tropical rain in this morning coming to the office. And I think all that um, in relation to, to uh, maybe the word that was mentioned at survival in, in Mexico and all the cities is key, right? How we treat pollution, how we treat uh, waste also is related to how we treat water. Uh, water coming from the uh, one of the most important rivers and that connects to one of the biggest uh, lakes in Mexico, it's like extremely polluted. There are actions taken, they're considering, for example, right now, uh, the usage of uh, the shell of eggs to try to uh, diminish the, the amount of minerals and, and contaminants in the water. But yeah, for sure, water, I think, will be a key issue to, to tackle in Mexico and probably in all the uh, areas related, right? Uh, Central America will be also a key issue uh, related to water. Yeah, I mean, I, oh, Jenny, go ahead. Yeah, uh, no, as I was saying, as, and as, I, as I, Enriquillo and Adrian has said, um, yeah, water is becoming, and rivers are becoming one of the main, uh, um, let's say opportunity for architects to reconstruct and rethink our cities and our urban development uh, and rivers and capturing water from <laughs> from the rain right and we do have the potential in let's say in Colombia we have actually regulations um, but we don't have the we still have, a, 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 let's say, um, a lack of connection between uh, the, the government as a client, let's say, and the architect. Because uh, we do as architects and landscapers, we want to create a nice landscaping project, but regulations are still like, uh, uh, they're still lacking, uh, giving all the opportunities and freedom to the architects to build in a different way. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's been a process that is coming to, to do uh, different types of projects, not building, not, 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 not turning rivers into channels, but turning channels into rivers uh, or returning them into the original rivers. Um, yeah, that was my, my intervention. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I have a question that's linked to this, but I, I see that Mark's raised his hand, so I'll ask get him to unmute to speak. Thank you. Um, I see a lot of my old friends here, and it's interesting to hear Harry talking about um, um, things. I, you notice I say Harry, not Enrique, but anyhow. Um, that, and, and I love how he thinks he's the oldest person here. Um, what I want to speak about in those things, though, is the, the region, um, the Latin, the, the Spanish region tends to call it the Antilles. We call it the Caribbean, in the Anglo-Caribbean. But there have been many joint things done. Um, I think... We are not aware of them. I think the broader, the architects largely aren't aware of a lot of the things that are happening. But in Jamaica, for instance, at the Caribbean, through the Caribbean School of Architecture, we had a forum with the Museum of Modern Art, for instance, on, um, on modernist architecture in the Caribbean. And it, that was in 2008. And those things allowed us to, um, to, to participate and share from Mexico, from, you know, all over the region, we were able to actually meet and talk about things. And it got published. Gustavo Luis More from, um, from 
the Dominican Republic actually published the proceedings and the Museum of Modern Art had it on their website. It seems that very few people were aware of it, but it was an excellent forum and we did a lot of work. Um, in recent times, I've been asked um, to, to actually go to, to Europe, to actually, through CARI Forum, talking again, people from the Dominican Republic, people from Haiti and so on, and actually talking about relationships, Trinidad and Tobago. In fact, I visited most of your countries over these years since you've last seen me. Um, actually talking about reciprocity agreements between Europe, and here I mean the United Kingdom, because I was, um, I was in London, I actually went to the AA tweet lunch, but there were too many students actually, so we had to leave very quickly. But anyhow, it was a wonderful thing to go back to, um, to, to uh, Brussels and to Paris, actually talking, and to the International Union of Architects, actually talking about working in our various countries, the problems that architects have in reciprocity, working across the region. So I've also had the privilege of, of being able to do this. But we continue to speak. One of the things is that our regions don't publish enough. We've often turned to the metropoles for publication. Now here I want to commend Brian. You see, Brian had this wonderful um, vanity publication on, 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 on um, modern Caribbean architecture. Beautiful, beautiful tome, which is really his, his excellence in photography. But he's also published Mannequin, which is about the work of his father, which is a fabulous publication. And very few of us get it. We don't see it, we don't know about it. So we don't share enough. And I think if the things that are being spoken about start to be written about, and that we start to translate them so we can actually talk across language barriers. I think these are ways, and the School of Architect, I've visited most of the schools, Harry, in, in, in the Dominican Republic and actually spoken to the people there. And, um, and I've done some of this in Mexico. So what I'm saying is, and Cuba, you know, I mean, I've been a visiting uh, lecturer at, in, 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 um, in, in Cuba. So what I'm saying is we need to do more of this. And I don't think we do enough. Um, thank you. We are reaching out people like Pat Green, Shani Bullock, who is writing, speak Spanish and other languages. And we actually do that. Um, Shani, in fact, studied in Mexico City. So I'm talking to my Mexican colleagues as well. So we try to share and the school does this. And thanks to Pat, we're talking to the AA again. When I arrived at the AA trying to even see your head, I won't call his name, he's my old colleague at school. He was busy having lunch, he didn't have time for me. You know, People from the region are not that important. But um, we need to make ourselves important. And today, Pat Green has made us important and we can talk to each other again. So thank you, Pat, thank you, AA, and lovely to see you all again. Hi, thank you so much. May I just, because people are asking who is speaking. This is Lester L. Mark Taylor from Jamaica. He and I started together in first year at the AA and he's a former head of the Caribbean School of Architecture. Thank you, Mark, my friend and colleague. <laughs> and he's currently a lecturer at the Caribbean School of Architecture. Thank you, Patricia. And thank you, Mark. I think you picked up on so many points that um, I wanted to make as part of this discussion in terms of how do we, um, I guess, connect all of these uh, countries, but also people more and um, and and how and, and I guess what you said about translation and the role of language as well and how we can uh, tr translate things in order to ensure that all of these great ideas and important issues really reach everybody and. I think your point about how the need to share and 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 connect is is now greater than ever. And today's event is really meant to be at the starting point, like so the first of many, we hope. And uh, based on how active everyone is in the chat, I think this is going to be the most successful global forum because everybody is so connected already. So it's really exciting to see. But um, I see that Nancy has a hand raised, so I'm going to ask her to unmute so she can ask her question. Hi, hello everyone. Actually, it was not a question so much as going more with what um, Taylor said already about publishing more. I'm realizing that we're in the same region, but we don't know what's going on with our neighbors. Um, we don't know as much of their history, their architecture. We study a lot about Europe, what's going on in the US and Canada, 
but uh, the person that's right next door to us is the person that we least have contact with. And it's not just in publication and in our field, even for traveling. It's easier for me to come to Canada than to say I'll go, I don't know, to Jamaica from Haiti, for example. And I'm thinking it's a great source of knowledge that we are sort of wasting, if I can say, because let's say in the case of Haiti, where we're having similar issues with everyone else in the Caribbean, probably there's a solution next door that could have worked better than something that was brought up by institutions um, coming from the US or Europe that were trying to help, but they don't deal with it with the same way, not having the same situation. And so the way they apply it in the country is not necessarily the best or the one that's more adapted to our way of life. So um, hurricane probably the, uh, in the US would have been Florida that knows most how we deal with it, um, how it feels like, but we don't build the same way. We don't live the same way. And uh, I'm thinking, um, like you said, this forum is a great first step, but we really should be pushing toward more conversation and more links in between all of us to see what can work, what has at work, and how we can improve on the lessons that we've already learned. That was just my remark, actually. Definitely. I think, thank you for contributing. Um, and I think it links to a lot of the things that Isabel mentioned in her presentation about the importance of knowledge transmission and, um, and also uh, this idea of, I, I think one thing I've really realized more than ever over the last year is how powerful the internet can be in, in connecting us um, in where we're in places where it's more difficult for us to tr travel. I mean, I thought it was really interesting what you said about how it's easier to go to Canada than it is to go to a neighboring country. And I think um, I, I think if there's a lesson to be learned maybe is that how do we start to use some of these platforms to connect more, but also to publish more and to ensure that this knowledge is shared. So thank you. Um, I'm conscious of time and that there's so many more questions that we could pro probably discuss. Um, and there's lots of really good comments in the chat as well. So I encourage everybody to read those. Um, I wanted to make maybe one more connecting point between something that um, a few of you brought up in the previous discussion, but that connects back to Adrian's presentation, which is this thing, I think, um, I, I, I think uh, Harry referred to it as political ignorance. And I think Jenny, you raised it as well in terms of how do we improve legislation or connect um, politicians and policymakers to architects. And um, Adrian, I was really struck when you were presenting by um, those Paris Climate Agreement targets and how they're really insufficient to, it, especially as we start to project further and further in the future. And it doesn't seem like that's enough. And I think spanning the Caribbean region, like, is is this an opportunity for architects to try and 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 get policymakers and governments to account, but also to set maybe a better standards for the future if we're going to so far exceed these carbon emissions. In, in, in the very near future and, and the kind of knock on, I think your presentation with that, those kind of triangles really drove home like the impact that's gonna have on GDP, on population um, and, and so many other things that you know probably that like, couldn't even fit on that page. So um, I don't know if you wanted to add anything to that to start with, but I think for everyone to respond to in terms of the connection between policy, government and architecture. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, to be honest, I was while I was working on the presentation, uh, I, I was shocked every day about the numbers. And I was trying to get all sources, right, uh, from local government to NGOs to ONU, uh, all types of data, trying to see, oh, maybe, you know, we're being too positive, maybe we're being too negative. So I was trying to, to move around all those data, and the data didn't seem uh, too exciting, let's say. So that's when I decided to, to go even further, right? To, to try to uh, have these projections going to a longer span than maybe my life to understand what will happen if something changes in the, in the next years, right? So my, my way to see things is that uh, the way I concluded, the next 10 years and probably worldwide uh, will be key to what happens for the next generation or for even for us, right? In the near future. Uh, these 10 years as architects, we are, we need to accomplish a lot of things. Not only provide housing, digni uh, dignified housing. We only have to provide all, thing, all the things that go around and that's mainly infrastructure. An infrastructure that is related not only to uh, 
let's say these uh, common areas or uh, foster uh, relationships bet between uh, the inhabitants. But in a way to, to promote what we do, what the actions taken in material wise, uh, right? Like we are one of the uh, industries that pollute the most as well. Like the word architecture, I think makes it look very, uh, uh, let's say uh, interesting to the topic. But then when you see the numbers, we look, we are like an evil industry and we shouldn't be doing that, right? We should be uh, working on the, on the total spectrum of the, uh, of the agendas. Uh, so I think that's our responsibility uh, and the responsibility goes with everything, no? All the decisions taken uh, while we design, while we uh, build, while, while we consider either climate change, uh, I think uh, all the things that we decide in the next years, 10 years, or tomorrow uh, will be key for the near future. Thank you. Um, uh, Brian, I think you had your hand raised next and then Jenny. So Brian, please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to mention that while Latin America and certainly Mexico and Haiti presented um, issues of the environment and so on, uh, I think the British Caribbean islands like Jamaica, Barbados, Trinidad, and so on, we, we suffer from a human problem. We, we are having an impact of the, of the Chinese investment in our countries, and it is, it is a serious problem. And I think um, it is a creeping one, which, of course, politicians are very keen to make use of because they come with large amounts of money. But I just wanted to say that's a different perspective than the ones presented, you know, that we have a human problem in that way. Thank you, bye-bye. Thank you. Jenny, should I go to you next? Uh, yeah, coming to the point of Adrian, of, uh, we are an evil industry, which is a hard sentence. Uh, but we are because we, we as architects uh, take resources to build our own our projects, right? Uh, and um, I think uh, uh, we, we do have the, the challenge to take our, uh, we as a region, um, biodiversity is one of the main uh, things, characteristic that differentiate us from other areas. And um, our resources are very, you know, we have water, we have mountains, we have um, um, different type of trees, flowers, birds, but uh, that biodiversity should come, should raise us um, in architecture. So, uh, and it, it, I feel it's a challenge for the, for our, our as our architects and um, probably for AA, um, students that come from the Caribbean. Okay, how biodiversity come fusion with this nice project that we do in AA? And uh, I think this uh, is one of the challenge, future challenge for us. Thanks, Jenny. Um, I'll go to Enrique and then, and then I'll go back to uh, Mark. Sorry, you're on mute. One second, I'm just unmuting you, Harry. Um, we need you to unmute. Oh, okay. Yeah, I I unmute. I didn't know I could unmute myself. When I saw you, you muted me, I said, "Gosh, had I said anything wrong?" Anyway, we forget uh, that you see when Pat started and introduced. The, the, the subject. She concentrated on, on, uh, uh, on the architects and people related to architecture that were working in the Caribbean. When I was at the AA, my year out, because after three years of exposure to what was going on in, in the Western, in Western architecture. I 
almost came to my own terms and said, no, no, I want tropical architecture. I was also lucky. My parents were living in Brazil. And in my year out, I went to Manaus. That is in the middle of the Amazon, where I tried to get a job with one of the most important tropical architects in history called, or his surname was Porto, P-O-R-T-O. I couldn't work because he didn't have enough work. So I then came to, to the Dominican Republic. The region, the Caribbean region, cannot stay isolated from other regions that share our climate. We have those two particular elements, which are the earthquakes and the hurricanes that are different, but generally the tropical humid climate is shared by a much larger community, both in the Americas as well as in Asia. So there's a big issue as to how we're going to uh, handle uh, this work group. I suggest, Pat, that uh, you, you set up a, a WhatsApp group. WhatsApp is easy. People walk around with, uh, with, their, with, their, with their mobiles and they can answer and talk. Uh, that might be interesting to get the dynamics. And we should do this, this, this type of uh, uh, event at least twice a year, maybe three. Thank you. Oh, and well done. Um, I'm just going to go to back to this. Just to make a final comment. Yeah. Is it Mark? OK. Um, I, we are very bad architects, are very bad at telling the population at large what we do. We don't explain ourselves very well. And then we complain when we don't get anywhere. I've asked in the past, how many architects are prepared to go into politics? We complain about the politicians, but we don't go into politics. Well, not in a direct way anyhow, right? So we stay on the fringe and we complain. Doctors don't do that. Lawyers don't do that. Accountants don't do that. But we do it. And then we wonder why the world doesn't change. If we want the world to change, we have to become a part of that change. And over my however many years, sorry, Harry, um, I've learned that. And so for all you younger people talking and listening, if you want to get change, you need to make the change. I see some of my former students, quite a few of you are presently listening in. And I've said this, and I'm saying it again. I know one or two architects who've stayed on the fringes of Jamaican politics and become senators and so on. And they've been listened to. I don't enter. But I have been able to get on a number of government bodies to advise them about the things that I think are important. And I might get the air of a minister, I get the air of many. Most times we're ignored because it doesn't tie in with the politics. But if we want to get things done and we want to be heard, we need to become a part of that. There's no point in just shouting into the void. It won't happen. Um, as I said, there was a trip to Europe to talk to the people. I had to come back. They warned me that these things are managed at a ministerial level. And if you want to get change, you need to persuade the ministers in your country. Well, what happened as we started to change, there was an election, the government changed, which is something that happens quite frequently around here. But um, these, are, these things are real. So architects can't just be people wanting the design work and, and to put your names up in stars. There are other ways to participate in the lives of architecture because we do much more than design buildings, which you all know. And through that, we can actually make some of that change. I just, one last thing, and I won't speak again after this, but um, I, I remember having a wonderful dinner 
with gentlemen from the grand old men of English architecture and Jamaican architecture in Jamaica at Devon House. And one of them said, do any of you have children who want to be architects? And we weren't sure. We said, well, we don't know. And we said, but why would you ask? And he said, because there is no better education in life than an architectural education. I want you to think about it. There's no broader education. Medical education is very narrow. Lawyers, you spend an evening with them and find out how boring they are. But architects speak on a wide range of subjects. We're involved in so much. And yet still we don't make it work for us. And I thought it was a very interesting thought. It also takes us very long to become architects. And um, I think that we sell ourselves short. So I'm talking to all of you that find a way to participate and help change the world. At least change your societies. And it's not just through design. In fact, that's probably the least way that you're going to change the world. Bye. Thank you very much, Mark. And um, I'm afraid we've run out of time um, for this session, but I think that's a really terrific note um, and a kind of call to action um, to end on. And uh, and these are all kind of points that we can pick up later in, in the day. And I just also wanted to note that Brian's point about um, the, the Chinese influence in the Caribbean is going to be picked up by Valeria, as she posted in the chat in session three. So please also get involved in that session. Um, but I would just wanted to say thank you to all of the panelists. Um, and I so appreciated all of the comments and presentations. And it was really a privilege to, to get to be part of your conversation. So thank you. Um, we're going to have a short, I think now six minute break um, uh, as a comfort break. and. Uh, and also there's a link, I think, to the spatial chat that will be posted in, uh, that has been posted in the chat. So if you want to meet and chat to each other as a kind of networking opportunity, please go do that for the next few minutes and then come back um, on the hour uh, to for the next session that will be chaired by Chris Pierce. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mary Jane. Welcome back, everyone. I think that we're going to start the second session. So hope you enjoy the first one and you enjoy the following ones. Chris, the floor is yours. Ooh, that, was a, that, was, that was a tight moment there. Was, uh, right to start the session, I realized my computer was running out of batteries. You almost hosted this session. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Chris Pierce. I'm uh, head of the visiting school at the Architectural Association, as well as having a number of other different roles within the school. But here today to chair a one hour, which is absolutely an inappropriate amount of time, but a one hour conversation on natural disasters and resiliency. So we've got four people in this session. Rose May, are you out there somewhere? And I wonder if you wouldn't just yes. turn on your camera and say hello. <laughs> That's great. Hello. Where are you? I'm there here you are. and listening. But because of bandwidth, I'm not going to have my video on while I'm making my talk, and I'll be back on live after. <laughs> Fantastic, Rose May. Nice to have you with us. Uh, Paco, Paco Rodriguez. Paco, you're here. Do you want to just say, say hello and uh, welcome? Hello, everyone. Looking forward to um, chatting with you and, uh, and uh, exchanging some ideas about this interesting subject. Excellent. Thank you, Paco. And then Nancy. Are, Nancy, are you out there somewhere? Nancy Leconte? Nancy, I think yes, you Yes, I am here. Excellent. That's great. Nice to be with you. Nice to have you here, Nancy. We'll come to you as we kind of work through the session. I just wanted to make sure you were there. And then Eugene, I think I've seen you here. Haven't I somewhere? Hello. Hello, Eugene. Can you hear me? Yeah, I'm right you. here. That's great. Super to have you with us. Thank you. Good. We've got, uh, listen, let's just roll right on. We've got about 55 minutes to go through a couple of papers and then some discussion. And I'm going to let this just roll. I want to let an hour's worth of conversation on natural disasters and resiliency just take place. So, Rose May, do you want to kick us off? Yes, and I will. Yeah, that would be great. And Rosemay, if you want to start off, because I was saying earlier, I definitely don't want to give a big biography background to everyone. So if you want to start off just by saying a little bit about yourself, and then we'll turn the screen and the floor entirely over to you for the next 15 minutes. 
Um, thank you very much. I was so hoping you will talk about me and I would not have to do it <laughs> myself. <laughs> but hey, um, I'm Rose Guignard. I'm uh, an architect by training. And, uh, and then I, I moved toward public policy. And uh, to make a long sh uh, story short, I uh, worked for a while as a faculty in uh, urban planning and public administration. And then after the earthquake, I decided to move back to Haiti and I work in the prime minister's office to try to usher urban policy changes. And now I'm on my own with a brand new um, civil society organization trying to ramp up um, discussion about urban issue and about the built environment. So that's a brief background on who I am. I don't know if you see my screen. I need to have technological feedback on that. Do you see oh, We see We see your screen very well. If you go to full screen or presenter yes. mode, it should be, yeah. I suspect it's gonna come up just right. Yes. So today I wanted to uh, spend some time and share with you some of my perhaps lesson learned and still concern that I have about resilience and the built environment. Um, so uh, today is what, Thursday, Wednesday, I don't know which day, but it's the 1st of July and all of us in the Caribbean are waiting for a tropical storm number five. And it's supposed to go over us uh, by Saturday afternoon. And I think Anarquillo had mentioned it. So this is our um, context and all of us in the region were wondering, myself in the case of Haiti, uh, are we going to have flooding again in places that we do not expect flooding? Hmm? And, and are we are going to have again to experience new, new surprises by this new regime, uh, the new re the climate regime that we are experiencing? So uh, 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 Isabel mentioned some of the stuff that I'm going to uh, be going over real fast, but I think it's important to make a point because uh, th there's a there's a superposition of issues that, that create vulnerability and, and of which we need to talk about when we're talking about resilience. So I call it the weight of landscape, right? Haiti is between two major earthquake plates and we have two major fault lines, the Enriquillo Plantain Garden and the Septid Septentrional. And, the, and, we, and everybody thought in 2010, it was the Enriquillo a fault line that created the earthquake, but it was not. It was an unknown <laughs> small fault line. So to Rose the May, Rose May, can I interrupt you for just one moment? Yes. And I'm sorry to do this, but on my screen, we have just the kind of PowerPoint presentation, but it never went full screen. So we're kind of just seeing, it's okay. hard to describe what I'm seeing. I, I, I know what you're seeing, and I don't know. I don't know how to to flip it. It's because I have two screen. Hold on one second. Yeah. I okay. Can do one thing and see if a change. And yeah, now, what okay. do you? Is it the same thing? Same thing. It, it's because when you went onto the weight of the landscape, it made me realize that we, we were kind of just seeing a kind of stuck screen in a way. It's, it, it's kind of caught, maybe stop sharing and then let's try resharing and, and, and see if that, yeah. yeah. Yep. Woo, the weight of the landscape. So <laughs> I was talking about earthquake and, and the fact our big earthquake did not come from our biggest fault line. So we're still waiting for our big one. We're on the path of the Atlantic hurricane. And what is concerning is that we had over a little bit over 30 hurricane to hit Haiti. 17 of them has have happened in the past 20 years. So we are seeing uh, an acceleration of um, hur hurricane hitting us. The, the third uh, landscape point is that we have a particular landscape and we're sharing the island with the Dominican Republic, Hispaniola, right? And uh, the Dominican Republic has a, a, has a landscape that's softer and has more plain. And we have the rugged part of the island. So we have very steep slope, rugged terrain and narrow coastal plain. And when they are not narrow, they are literally delta plains. So this is the uh, environment in which one has to live and one has to build. Uh, the, the, the second layer is the layer of urban growth. In the past 30 years, Haiti has shifted from being 
primarily rural to an urban country. And we are now 64% urbanized and we're the fourth largest urban growth country area in the region. And, and this urban growth is, sorry, this urban growth is followed by, um, by uh, 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 have some characteristic. First, there's no economic growth. So we're having urban growth and poverty. Uh, most of the uh, constructions are informal. So it's in the informal sector, it's for people building. Um, some have suggested that 80% of new construction is informal. And, and then, and, and, and you layer urban growth with the landscape, you have increased vulnerability and particularly increased vulnerability for folks, for vulnerable folks, for fo folks with poor means. So wh what are we doing and what are we talking about when we're talking about resilience, right? Um, you, everybody is familiar with the Sendai um, priorities and in the Sendai priorities, they say that first you have to understand your risk, what kind of um, risk are you dealing with? Do you, can you, do you know it in order to manage it? We talk about enhancing disaster preparedness and we talk about strengthening governance to manage disaster. But one of the priority of Sendai is to reduce vulnerability to improve resilience. And what I want to talk about here today is reduce vulnerability of the built environment to improve resilience. So what challenges, that there are challenges that we need to address in order to manage and protect the, our ecosystem. And there are decisions that we need to make about land, land management. The, the second issue that's crucial for Haiti's recent history, the past 10 years history, is resilience of housing, resilience of infrastructure, uh, housing infrastructure, right? Um, um, can, can, is the new um, construction in Haiti, really can it really uh, withstand um, uh, earthquake that are over uh, 0.5 uh, five or, or six like we had 10 years ago? What happened to access to build it, good building materials, to code, et cetera. So when we're talking, let's talk about disaster risk in the land management and talk about the thing that's very important today in a country with the landscape of Haiti is stormwater challenges. And I agree with uh, Enriqueo that water, making sure that we, we have potable water for the next for the next generation is also a, a key issue to deal with, but I'm not going to address it in this talk, right? So when you have urban growth in this environment, um, what the first thing that happened is that you're increasing the surface that become impervious, uh, which means that the water is no longer penetrating the landscape, your, your water tables are not being recharges, right? But the second thing that happened is that you have more water in your watershed and more water means that existing drainage sometimes cannot keep up with the, the, the volume and the intensity of the water circulating and this cause uh, damages. The third thing happening um, in terms of risk is that you have folks living in low-lying coastal area. 75% of cities in Haiti are on the coast and this is a legacy of colonization. So, so you have all your cities in low-lying coastal area and, in, uh, and most folks on the coast, on the water, live in informal housing. And then dealing with with stormwater management is always the question of cost, the question of timing, and the question, the, the question of feasibility. So to give you an, uh, an idea of Haiti, the last, uh, the last time major stormwater work was done in Haiti, date back from the late 80s. Um, they've had done some maintenance on the stormwater drainage of the metropolitan uh, area but there has not been uh, investment since to, um, to, to, repair, to repair, continue, extend uh, stormwater drainage. So we're, we're li living in this 
we see the menace, we see the vulnerability, we know the risk and the, the solution um, are, not, are yet to be found. So what I want us to start thinking about is uh, in, in a context uh, of a, a country with limited financial resources, with limited knowledge, and I think uh, Isabel talked about the, the knowledge gap issue. Um, there, 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 there are two things we must uh, do today to begin to uh, respond and find so resilient solution for this issue. Um, one, of, one first thing is social behavior change, right? Uh, perhaps the, the thing that is most difficult when dealing with engineer and talking about drainage issue, um, it's, it's uh, getting past the engineering culture of concrete. That's the way I like to frame it best because you, you, you're, you're having a watershed problem. Let's put some concrete, some big canals and we'll deal, and we deal with it. And, and, it's off, and what we're finding out today, and it's across all landscape, is that the concrete is not the best solution for this type of problem. And, and so, so we, we, we need to have social behavior change to, uh, for, for the engineers, but also for uh, uh, the, the, the simple man deciding to build his houses because he has to build differently. There are two solutions for me to start to implement in the context of Haiti is to read to, to get uh, systematically green infrastructure as part of the solution for stormwater drainage. So, so I'm suggesting we need to change the paradigm on how we're dealing with this issue, especially on the coastal zone, especially in the gullies, in the ravine. And at the personal level, architects need to get their clients to get into the point that there, there, there are decisions that are systematic you cannot put concrete on 100% of your plot. You need to leave a, a, a percentage for water to be absorbed. And, and you need to get into rain harvesting. And Isabel has heard, um, heard me say that again, if I had my way in Haiti, rain harvesting would be mandatory for everybody. So let's, let's switch topic and, and get into housing and earthquake. And I'm sharing this map and it's the Southern Peninsula in Haiti. And this is a built area density map. And some of you will recognize quite easily the fault line and you will see that there is um, an important density on the fault line, right? So, so people, it, it's a, it's a magnific magnificent landscape. Um, the, it's, uh, the temperature is nice and people are, are living there and, uh, and not thinking through what it means for, for housing and building. And this is also uh, another challenge that engineer and architect have with uh, making sure that uh, the structures are appropriate for this particular risk, right? So quick, quick lesson learned from the earthquake. Um, uh, the, the efforts are, the results are mixed. Um, we know that we've done a lot of work into code, coding, code, uh, improvement of code and pushing for in the practice that the codes become a reference. We've done a lot of work in knowledge. We've done a lot of work, but not enough. We've, we've um, published all kinds of material for everybody um, at, this, at, this, at the scale of the, of the engineering practice um, to, to make sure that folks uh, know about proper proper practice as to laying the blocks to how to tie your beams. There, there, is, there have been uh, effort for diffusion of knowledge, but, but this is not enough. And this does not come close to what needs to happen in Haiti to ensure that new housing are resilient to, to earthquake. And, and some of the, perhaps uh, the, the barrier to this is that our efforts are not are, are not at scale. Where we are still having 
pilot effort, we are still targeting very small particular subgroup of the population and we're not making it a national priority to, to diffuse um, uh, knowledge. The other thing is a question of construction material and perhaps this is an issue that we need to discuss uh, as uh, folks working in the Caribbean. What is the problem with getting access to quality building materials? I know that everybody in Haiti is complaining about quality of cement, quality of steel, etc. cetera. Um, so moving on to another issue, most people are building informally. Um, how, how do we make housing in informal neighborhood climate resilient and climate friendly, right? Uh, how, how do we get to that? Um, how, do we, how do we get past and how do we diffuse model that goes beyond the cement uh, cage, right? How do, we, uh, how do we change people behavior? How do we introduce and how do we make it easy for folks to systematically, even in an informal area, where land is really precious to include trees in order to reduce the heat? And how do we begin to think about an architecture that leave minimal impact on an already fragile environment? So, so, so for me, these are today um, key issues that undermine any thinking about resilience of the built environment in our case in Haiti. And I think any agenda for resilience of housing need to really be mindful and engage in developing new paradigm and introducing new technology. So we can uh, somehow, as Isabel said, reclaim those old building practices, adapt them to, to current use, um, but at the same time also try to incorporate new building practices. And I think that was one of the effort uh, that all of us who were involved into the BAMU lab who wanted it to be successful because it was an opportunity to um, add on something that could still fit in the local building ecosystem. And then, um, and then modeling those new insight and, and be clear about sustainability of construction, sustainability at a personal level, sustainability at a national level, regional level and global level. One other key issue, and, and this is my uh, personal takeaway for the past 10 years, is that we don't do enough to develop local talent pool. Right, so we have expert come in, we have expert come into the project and when the project ends and we find ourselves with really minimal handful of folks who, who can carry on the thought, who can carry on, carry on the work. And today I think in anything that we do in Haiti today, everything has to be, has to have the component of we are developing a local talent pool and these people, and, and we need to do what needs to be done so that they are continuously feed in and they are continuously improving. The transformation means that talents are being developed and talents are able to grow. The third issue, and I think, um, and this is a question also for, for the rest of the region, I would be happy to hear feedback, is designing with community. For so long, our profession has been seen as elitist. Um, and I think um, the past 10 years have shown us that the project that have been the most successful were the project that were literally designed with, by, with the community and the architect was here to solve technical issue. And the fourth thing I want to leave you is, I think uh, in, for us today, we really need to uh, develop a sense of mission in architecture, the, the mission of making sure, at least for us in the Caribbean, that we have to push for that resilient architecture that is adapted to nature, to economy, to lifestyle, and, it, it, and nobody else will do it for us. We have to do it. So these are my thoughts, and uh, I'll be happy to engage in the discussion later.
And now I have to stop sh sharing. Thank you very, very much, Rosemary. Thank you very much. Paco, I'm gonna pass straight over to you. Again, Paco, if you do a short introduction of yourself before you kick off, then take over the screen and then we'll have, we'll still have a nice time of about 30 minutes, just have a good conversation with the two respondents and everyone else. Thank you, thank you so much. And uh, good evening everyone and uh, good afternoon in, in London. Uh, Rosemary, thank you very much for that presentation. It's great to be uh, uh, presenting alongside, uh, uh, you know, a uh, presentation about Haiti, uh, coming here from, from Puerto Rico. I'm actually uh, coming to you from, from San Juan, where I grew up uh, and, uh, and was, uh, did all of my education until the university, where when I went to the U.S., I did my undergraduate at Georgia Tech and, and the graduate work at uh, GST at, at Harvard. I taught at the University of Puerto Rico for 20 years, nine of those as Dean of the School of Architecture. Then for a uh, <clears throat> moment of period of three years, I was the, the president of ACSA, the Association of Collegiate Schools of Architecture. Uh, and, uh, and after that, for about a year and a half, mostly the whole time of the pandemic, I have been the director of the University of Illinois School of Architecture at Urbana-Champaign, <clears throat> where I am, uh, even though I am in Puerto Rico for the for the summer, thanks to Zoom, and, and presenting here in London, thanks to Zoom, uh, as well, I am you know most of the work I am doing right now at, uh, at Illinois. So let me go straight to the to sharing uh, my screen and, and show you a little bit of uh, what I would like to uh, to talk about. Let's see. Uh, you know, some some of the slides I'll, I'll I'll go on quickly to get to a point where we can do some uh, some discussion. But I'll take the opportunity to show a few images about about our context in in Puerto Rico. Uh, some some architecture that you would consider uh, historic from different periods. Uh, uh, some from uh, the, the so-called tropical modernity, many of those at the University of Puerto Rico by, by architect Henry Klum. A lot of what some of the architects that I worked for in the in the 90s and, and the end of the century were doing mostly in in San Juan, in the metro area. And then some of the work that my colleagues are doing in the in the 21st uh, century. And I also since I am aside from an educator I am a practicing architect. I also wanted to show a few of the things that I that I have worked on in in, uh, in, in Puerto Rico and and, and other had the opportunity to work in other countries as as well. Uh, but I wanted to start with this image when I was president of ACSA. I was giving a lecture in in, in Marfa. So you can see there in the in the top left hand corner it says October 12th, 14th. So that that was less than a month after Hurricane. Uh, Maria hit uh, Puerto Rico, and that was the cover of, of Architect Magazine uh, that year. Uh, I know that, that global warming is, is an issue uh, right now in, in, uh, in world politics, certainly in U.S. Uh, politics as well, with, uh, with the two sides polarized in, in terms of uh, uh, suggestions of, uh, of what is needed. Uh, but I took the opportunity that day to talk about my own experience because I, I, I was participating in a, in a Congress at the UIA in, in Seoul, uh, South Korea, when we found out that Hurricane Irma, which was, you know, the biggest Atlantic hurricane then, was uh, uh, storming through the Atlantic. And we flew immediately from, from Seoul and got stuck in, in Atlanta. And, and, and thankfully, the, the hurricane veered north and, and just scraped the corner in, in Puerto Rico, but I, I, a colleague of mine was vacationing in St. Martin and, and the hotel where he was staying was completely destroyed and he was flown by the Air National Guard to Puerto Rico. And, and we had a dinner with him that day talking about what he had experienced in, in St. Martin, not knowing that, uh, that in a week from then, that small tropical depression in the Atlantic would turn as soon as it hit the, the, the warm waters of the Caribbean would turn into a four category four or five hurricane that we then uh, knew as, as Hurricane uh, Maria. 
uh, a little image of, of Puerto Rico and the, the various hurricanes and, and categories that have gone through the island. So this is a topic that we take very, uh, uh, very seriously. And as you can see, you know, some of the areas that are prone to, to floods in, in, in Puerto Rico, especially on the coast and close to uh, San Juan and the, and the metro area, and, and cultural heritage sites that are at risk of inundation from sea level rise. Uh, these are these are some image, is, images that were prepared by a, a, a collective in, in San Juan called AEIOU, Victor Nieto and Pedro Santa, that when they presented them at the, at the UPR, we saw them as, as apocalyptic, right? And oh my God, the, 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 you know, it's going to be flooded like that and people are going to be walking, you know, and, and but a few years after that, here's the mayor of San Juan, Carmen Julin Cruz, right after Hurricane Maria, going through one of the flooded areas in, in, in San Juan. So we should, we should take these images and, and, you know, more seriously. And uh, I'll, I'll, I started reading about the, the relationship between hurricanes and, 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 and weather and, and weather forecasting. This is a great book about the hurricane in Galveston, but not just about the hurricane in Galveston, but about the, the creation of the U United States Weather uh, Bureau. Those of you who like Eric Larson and who've read Devil in the White City, and, and uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic uh, book and, uh, about that terrible hurricane in, in, in Galveston, Texas in, in the year 1900 and what it did to that, to that city. And then we worked uh, together with, uh, uh, from the UPR and several other universities, we worked with uh, New Orleans after Katrina, and I do consider New Orleans a, a Caribbean city uh, with uh, Caribbean culture. Uh, as well. I think it's more like us than it is like the rest of the, the, the U.S. And uh, <clears throat> go through this because a lot of these stats you, you already know, right? But this is what it did to, uh, to New Orleans. This is a, a whole neighborhood. You can see there almost the roofs almost as as coffins and look at the Astrodome when they had to move all the people inside. And, and here we can talk about a lot of social issues uh, as well about what about the government's response or lack of response uh, to the city and to certain neighborhoods. And, and our students, and you can see them, they work directly with the community to, to talk about uh, possibilities in terms of, and this is at the lower ninth board, and, uh, and we were welcomed into, into their homes, into the community, spent time there, worked with them uh, together in, uh, in developing some, some ideas that were not prescribed, but actually uh, uh, a product of, of collaboration with the community, as opposed to some of the other houses that you see there from the, from the Make It Right Foundation that sort of arrived by, by air. They started calling it the Make It White Foundation. And these are the students at the ACA site conference after they presented the work that they had done in, in, in New Orleans. Uh, in, in my experience in, in Puerto Rico, uh, I obviously Hurricane Hugo, right you know, at the time when I was going to, uh, to university, that went through the island uh, and then Hurricane Georges uh, as well. But certainly uh, it was the, the 2017 hurricane season that, that is closest to my, uh, to my experience and, and that still causes post-traumatic stress disorder, especially these days when we see, begin to see, and uh, uh, you showed the, the image of the storms that are, that are beginning to come into the Caribbean at a, at a record early date. And who knows what we can expect for, for this year, but there were four hurricanes that actually made landfall uh, in, in US territory that, uh, that year. And you can see some images from, from Houston. Look at the storms at the same time. And, and we knew that, that Maria at that point was going to go straight, you know, diagonally through, through the island. Uh, uh, came in through the, through the southeast. And this is, look at the size of the, of the hurricane. It is just coming into Puerto Rico and some of its bands are already hitting the, the Dominican Republic. And it went right diagonally through the island, 
specifically through the area that is considered urbanized area where it did the most uh, damage. Uh, most of you have heard about the categories of, of hurricanes. So you can see here uh, uh, some images of, of what a category one, two, three, four, and category five will do to certain types of, uh, of constructions and, and materials and everything that was wood was completely blown away. You see some of, some of the images uh, after the hurricane. The relationship between construction and the and, and the and the coastline, and we're seeing some of that in in Miami. The, this, these terrible images and terrible situation with the building in Miami that that we've seen this this week, and we responded in the the UPR by by creating uh, uh, some research centers, uh, the urban think tank Ciudad, and a, a bioarchitecture research center there with Professor Pedro Muniz, and, and started working on on. On projects like this one, the the solar decathlon, and I know Jorge Mendez, who's who's here, uh, led one of these efforts. And the, right after Maria, we did a, a joint studio with uh, Cooper Union in New York, where the students came to Puerto Rico, and then we went to New York, and, and did a did a master plan on on this area, which is Ocean Park in San Juan, which is one of the areas that immediately floods after after even after normal rain. So you can imagine what happens after after a big hurricane. That's a street in, in, in Ocean Park. So these are, these are some of the, the uh, ideas uh, by our students in terms of trying to urbanize this, uh, this area. This is when the students from both institutions came together to work on the, on, on the project and started presenting their, their different uh, ideas and came up with this master plan that actually took the waters and, and, and uh, channeled them through a, through a park and actually made some really interesting connections, both, both urban, spatial, and even social uh, around the area. And this was the, the presentation at Cooper Union in, in New York, a really positive experience of, of you know, having students from all over the world talking, discussing, uh, debating uh, some ideas and, and, and solutions. And, and that year, the, the Society of, of Architects and Engineers in Puerto Rico decided to do a competition for a resilient uh, house. Uh, it originally, it was mainly for licensed professionals, engineers and, and architects. And, uh, and I asked if, if my group of students that I usually teach the competition studio could participate with my license and, and they agreed and, and the work that was done by the students ended up winning the, the second prize and uh, which was this this house uh, and uh, the first prize was going to be built uh, they decided after seeing the work of the students that, that they were going to build the students work uh, as well it still hasn't happened but I know there have been many meetings uh, uh, about it the first one the first prize was already built so I do hope that the stu students get the chance to uh, to build their 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 idea, which was very well uh, thought out, very flexible, and it and it promoted uh, certain possibilities about bringing them together as, as townhouses, as uh, row houses, as single-family dwellings where other house and spaces where other houses were destroyed. So so it was very conscientious effort from from their part, from a generation that is already I think much more committed and conscientious than than for example mine. Uh, was uh, they're, they're thinking more about collective and groups and making a, a profound difference than they are about individual success. And, and I'll finish with this slide, which is not true. We saw the the real one uh, that uh, that was previously presented with some stories, but you know this is what we look forward to when we open this this website, right? To have no new tropical cyclones expected. Uh, unfortunately, we do have a couple coming uh, uh, our way. Uh, and as soon as they hit the warmer than average waters of the uh, of the Caribbean, they, they expand. That's what you know feeds them and makes them grow. That's what happened with Maria. Went from a tropical depression to a Category Four virtually overnight. And and this is one of the problems of, of global warming that a, a lot of what causes it takes place elsewhere. The decisions take place elsewhere, but those who pay the price for those decisions 
are in different places that have no voice or vote in the political debates that, uh, that will shape global warming uh, politics in the present and in the future. Thank you very much. All right, thank you very, very much, Paco. The two of you have, uh, two of you have given us quite a lot to think about um, and talk about. Um, Nancy, I wonder if I don't come to you, uh, yourself and then Eugene, for a little bit of kind of response, commentary, additional thinking, and then we'll open it up to everyone for some conversation. Of course. Um, actually, I really liked the presentation um, that we just had. And I kept thinking back about what um, Mark Taylor said recently. Um, we don't have architects making policies because as I'm thinking um, Rosemary's presentation and looking at what's going on, she mentioned, for example, that there's no, well, it's a fact, economic growth is not happening in Haiti, um, but you have urban growth. Uh, probably too fast for what we can handle. And a lot of it has to do with the bad policies. Um, when you look, go into any books of laws in Haiti, everything is there. Um, the institutions, everything is written, but everything stays in theory because as time passes, there's less and less people to actually implement what's going on. Um, part of it is, well, we have the political problems, corruption, of course, but then who's going to come and actually make a move? We have a lot of brain drain, had, drain wait, brain drainage, as um, Isabel was saying earlier. Um, everybody's trying to make a run for it the moment that they can, and you can understand according to the current situation, very few choose to return and stay, which is not helping. And that exacerbates the problem of not having enough people to implement good policies. Um, so what usually happens is that um, you're gonna have a flood of people coming to the urban areas, too much concrete, as Rosemary was saying, and of course, too much concrete in the wrong places because everybody wants to be as near as possible to the centers, the city centers, which makes sense. That's where the economic activity is happening. But um, if you look at the landscape of Haiti, uh, we have a lot of mountains. So the spaces where we have the cities usually are in trap between two big mountains or straight in front of the sea. Like for example, in my hometown is between the, the sea and the, a mountain behind it, which in case of a hurricane or tsunami, I don't even want to think about what's going to happen, but everybody's flooding there and um, constructing around the mountain, around the ravines, making it more of an issue for um, the sustainability is one problem, but security destroying all the landscape in the mountains, so less trees. And as she was saying, you're gonna have water that's no longer retaining in the, um, the, the water um, underground, um, which gives more issue for um, flooding. In, the, in case, for example, in that hometown, in my hometown of Cap, for example, you won't see a lot of flooding, but as more as more you have more people, more rain, the capacity of the, the structure of the town is not enough to actually um, catch all that water. And it's creating more of a problem for, for the city in itself. And you're seeing that repeating across cities uh, in, the, in the country. Um, and so that creates more vulnerability, more poverty. And of course, that's created the problem of people having less access to um, the professionals, architects that are considered a luxury. Because why pay for an architect when I can have a worker put two blocks for me. And so as Rosemary was saying that we're, there's a lot of effort that's being done toward educating the public. Although I understand the need for it, but I find it unfortunate that we have to resort to having the people help themselves. And it goes back again. Can we have people in architecture that knows the issue, people in, urban, in the urban industry that knows the issue, be at the political level where they can actually make change that makes sense to this very system because they know what the problem is on the, uh, on the ground, they know what the expectations are and they will be able to make informed policies instead of having, well, the situation that we have now. And again, saying that we're bringing experts from the outside can be helpful, but in reality, what we're saying, what we're seeing is exactly what we just said. Um, we have very little that's left as far as knowledge and technology when the experts are gone. 
So yes, we do appreciate having them here, but what this for us to be able to help ourselves. And let's say that um, they, we do have knowledge that is transferred. We go back again to the problem of brain drainage. I'm gonna be able to say it. <laughs> um, because exactly as the, it, it becomes a circle and you're not seeing the end of it. Um, and when you're talking, for example, with the, the other presentation about the, all the hurricanes, and we know that they're coming more and more frequent, they're coming with more and more force, which is in the, uh, in the case of Haiti, in its position with all the mountains that we have, it's sort of a blessing because by the time it hits a mountain, it tends to be lower, but then all the coast, that's where everybody is. The South, for example, whenever there's a hurricane, you can bet there's gonna have problems there. You don't even have to think about it. Matthew, for example, hit us pretty hard. Um, but what is being done to actually help to actually have sustainable solutions because you're not going to be able to stop that hurricane. I'm sorry. We don't know when the next earthquake is going to come, but then do we do like Dominican Republic that now, for example, they were talking about Santo Domingo earlier with um, flooding that no longer have the same problem because it's all concrete. But then when an earthquake happened, what do you do? So it, it's kind of like you have to choose the lesser of two evil of how do you solve something. The solidity that you need for the hurricane that's every single year or having so much concrete that in case of an earthquake, we have issues, which shouldn't be too much of a problem even then if you're looking at, for example, Chile, when they had the earthquake, they didn't lose that many people. So what can we implement from them that will help us? And again, we go back, we are our brain, where are our brains to actually help us build all, that, all those resources. Because when you, for example, talk to um, young people, the students, um, well, usually that's where all the dreams are because, well, you haven't had the, the full impact of real life and, you know, nine to five and go back to work and come back and you still have time to dream. And you see all the hope that there is there, all the things that they could do. But then in this particular case of Haiti, you also have the situation where, well, we have a lot of hope, but again, we're seeing that, well, there's nothing being done around so we can actually do something. Some people, and I applaud Isabel for that, for really trying to stay and trying to educate because it takes a lot of strength actually to do that, especially in Port-au-Prince because all the issues happening right now in terms of political um, social unrest is mostly in the capital area and that's where she is, um, but it's impacting the, the whole country. And so the young generation coming in, yes, they're being educated, but then they have to think, okay, how can I implement this? What can I do to help? And it's a situation that you're gonna find not just in Haiti everywhere really, because let's say for example, in the US, I was reading an article about how the generation that are leading now, the Nancy Pelosi's, they've been there a while. And some things that are happening now with the younger generation, they're no longer in touch with. They don't have students that, for example, the same way that somebody that just graduated. There's this disconnect that you find in between two extreme generation. And of course you find it also in Haiti um, with the added problem that the example that the young generation is seeing is not the same um, because for the past 30 years, well, it's been one problem after the other. And so, as architects, we should be thinking, um, like, what can we do partially with our clients? But in situation like Haiti, I'm thinking also, should we be thinking also of the greater goal, um, a greater impact? What can we do um, besides that one client that we're helping to help the neighborhood, to help that town? Because that the, those little added, um, actions are what's gonna help actually the whole country. I will take a personal example. Working in Haiti, um, I was working in an institution right after the earthquake that was doing retrofitting um, in poor neighborhoods, in a slum actually. And I remember thinking, whenever I was working with one client in particular, I really felt hopeful because you understood that you were helping that person that couldn't help themselves, giving them access to resources, professionals to actually do uh, work that they would have not been able to afford if they were by themselves. But then if you, whenever I went back to the bigger picture, seeing what were we doing for the town in itself, for the country in itself, I felt guilty. Because usually what would happen is that I'm thinking this whole, um, you have this whole project 
that mega budget that's being invested in a slum, we understand that this, you cannot get rid of the slums, but we also have a large amount of space um, with, where you could actually develop um, communities with actual rules, actual infrastructures, infrastructures. And what ended up happening is having another slum, Kanaa, would open right next door, even bigger, and it, the problem just multiplied. So yes, with the one little action, I helped one person. I helped multiple person in that neighborhood because it was multiple housing that we touched. But then what did I do for that town? What did I do for my country? It was very paradoxical, actually, the feeling with on the one side you're helping and the downside, the other side you're not. But it goes back to what policies are that exist. Because what is the government doing to try to canalize the help that's coming, the professionals that are there, um, the what plans exist to actually improve instead of what, 11 years later, we still, I wanna say almost at the same point, even if, if not worse, because yes, we do education, but um, we're not getting richer. That person that couldn't afford to build correctly still can't afford to build correctly. And it's even worse. And we don't even think, for example, the middle class, very shrinking middle class, that in case of another problem, can't afford to help themselves because they will be in the middle where they're too rich to be helped, but not rich enough to help themselves. And um, Bozme put a lot of good point on the table, but honestly, every time she said something, I was like, Mark Taylor was right. We need to be in politics. We need to be able <laughs> to go back and make our own rules to see how we can actually implement things. Um, in Haiti, for example, with Isabel, there's a group um, that the young architects have with Crayon that what the idea of it was actually trying to bridge the gap between the old and the new generation, the, the, the everyone that had left that was coming back and see how we could foster change. But again, um, those are small actions that hopefully will produce good roots and a bigger tree. But for now, it's just that. Small talks in between us, punctual activities, but nothing that's actually amplifying. So I don't know if I should say Rosemary or Isabel, which one of you are taking the lead <laughs> to get into politics. <laughs> but um, I'm thinking we need to be taking power in as architect, take the reign as what we can do on a global scale, on a bigger scale than just this one-on-one -on -one client that we're talking about. Um, for now, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Nancy, that was a lot. That was good. Yeah, that was. That, encapsul <laughs> that encapsulated a lot of the issues and a lot of the challenges. You also made me think when I agreed to host a session on natural disaster, I should have never sought optimism in a way. I mean, wow, this is challenging. This is, you know, my God, all of a sudden that natural disaster rang home. Uh, Eugene, are you out there somewhere? I think you must be. Yes, I am. Yeah, Eugene, now I'm, I'm looking to you to solve these issues, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I attended the AA during the reign of Alvin Boyarsky. And um, I live in a small island uh, called Dominica. It is said that when Christopher Columbus discovered it, he took a sheet of paper, crushed it up, and showed it to King Ferdinand and said, that's it. It's a very uh, densely forested island, which was severely devastated by Hurricane Maria in uh, 2017, September of 2017. Now, following that hurricane, uh, a number of professional and technicians came over from different places like the US, um, Israel, Europe, and so forth, to see what could be done to make the structures more resilient. Uh, generally speaking, the structures that we have here are really of reinforced concrete frame construction, and they either have a uh, timber, frame roof with galvanized, corrugated galvanized sheet metal finish, or it's a reinforced concrete slab. Now the reinforced concrete slabs were quite resilient. Uh, it was found during the um, hurricane. However, a lot of the damages were to the um, timbers framed roofs 
And what was found was that these roofs were not securely anchored to the um, structural concrete frames. And also the timber framing was not as um, structurally sound as they were supposed to have been. So that these technicians came and were showing uh, our uh, builders how to construct more resilient timber frames. And since then, they were introducing things like um, bigger structural uh, timber frames with bigger members. And also they introduced some uh, metal plates to secure some of the members to the, uh, to the overall frame. And that was how um, the people were shown how to build more resilient structures. Also, the government of the day decided to uh, create um, a group called uh, the Resilience Group of Dominico, where they invited some technicians and some professionals to you know, basically establish some ideas regarding uh, the more resilient um, structural construction techniques. Um, that is all I've got to say presently. Um, I will surely answer any questions from the floor. Thank you. Thanks, Eugene, very, very much. Um, let's open it right up. Anyone, uh, Paco or Paco or Rose May, would either of you like to respond in the first instance? And then we kind of open it up to anyone else who might have some comments. I just, I just wanted to say that, that real quick that, um, that I appreciate the fact that Rosemary decided to go back to Port-au-Prince and, and be part of, sit at the table where decisions are made. Uh, I think we need architects and, and, and planners to take on, the, on that role and, and, and hopefully we'll see more in this generation. I, when, when I was at ACSA, I said uh, that regarding the, the topic of STEM, uh, science, technology, engineering, and, and uh, mathematics, when President Obama said that he was starting that and, 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 and it was for the innovators, the visionaries, the creators, and originally the architects were not in that group. And I said, not only they need to be in that group, they need to lead the discussions in that group. And eventually, you know, after that, it, it, architecture was incorporated into the STEM field. And, and you know, for education purposes, it, it has a lot of benefits as well. But I think from our part, we need to be able to, to, to start seeing the, the, the world, you know, outside of, of this focus condition of our, what our next project is, is going to be. And, and sometimes even create our own, our own work and make a difference in, in, in that sense and see, you know, see, see the work in a completely different way than what was taught in architecture schools in, in most of the 20th uh, century and, and begin to make a profound difference in, in the communities not only in the ones we live, but but also in, in, in you know, it's, the world is a smaller place. The, uh, you know, it's, it's easier to reach. Here we are, you know, I'm talking to some of you in London, some of you in Europe, in Africa, in Asia, Latin America, and the Caribbean. And we're here together talking about, about some common uh, subjects. And, and it's important that we, that we make that commitment, that, that we actually decide to be a part of that table where, where the important decisions are made. And that is a creative project as well. And an important one. Yes, absolutely. Paco. Well, Rosemary. Well, this is one thing I'm um, um, reacting a bit about what Nancy said. And I think um, for the good of everybody, I, I think we need to acknowledge that the situation is difficult. But I think groups such as Isabel's group or the, the group that Nancy mentioned, could Crayon, this young architect, are really trying to foster a community of practice. And they may not realize it, but I realize how much they have shifted some issue, how much they have, they, they have forced their way in, uh, uh, in places where decisions are made and they don't realize that they have done that. Uh, for, for example, um, the group of Isabel was able to, to carry forward and create a presence for itself within the Domino community to say, if you're doing anything about the built environment, you have to come through us because we are, we are a community of practice. We represent social uh, society and our social society are the people we're building and thus um, moving, creating, changing the environment and you have to work with us. So, so change is incremental and incremental, you don't see it, you don't feel it, 
but um, I, I have to say that I, I think there there are things that are shifting, and and uh, there, there are places for there, there is there is a place for everybody, and things are shifted. But you have to remain committed. You have to remain committed to the work. Excellent. Thank you, Rosemary. There's a few questions out there, and I thought maybe we kind of work through them as well, or comments, questions. Drew, I'm going to come to you first in my kind of list of raised hands. Are you there? I am, yeah, Chris, thanks. Um, I, I just wanted to comment kind of on this, the, the public policy discussion that's been happening out of this this conversation. And I, I think one thing that's quite quite uh, important is is not even, you know, getting involved with pub public policy at the professional level, but even somehow trying to implement it as architects at the, the educational and university level. Um, the, my undergrad um, in, in the States, um, at Auburn University, they've started actually implementing a public policy um, master's degree that's attached onto the, the rural studio um, program that the, the students take part where it's a, it's a design build uh, program in rural Alabama. And and they uh, you know, design and build their thesis projects, but most of them end up staying beyond graduation. So what they've implemented is this additional one year master's in public policy, which I think is quite interesting. And, and really, I think could, could be something that other, you know, uh, educational professionals could, could try to push within their own university systems to, to try to begin to foster this sense of public policy and, and understanding that we do have the possibility and potential to change these things um, and don't have to necessarily rely on the politicians. So, I, I mean, I think that would be something I would encourage everybody to try to do who is involved in, in uh, university teaching and that sort of thing is to begin, you know, even to bring that up at, at, at the teaching level. True. Thanks very, very much. I'm going to yeah. take, I know Bea is going to cut me off in a minute, but before I do that, I want to get Patricia to get involved here for a second. And oddly, before we uh, before we turn over, I also want to point out, if you all would please use the chat, because Bronca has written a really interesting kind of question about concrete, which we've been discussing now. So please don't hesitate to jump into the chat as well after the session is complete. Patricia, I'll stop talking and over to you now. I would like to defer to Audley, and after he speaks, I will talk. Thank you. Of course. Audley, over to you. Hi. Hi. Hi everyone. Um, thanks, Patricia, for showing my project. The the unique thing about that project that um, Patricia showed is that it's probably the most resilient project in the world, and I will tell you the reason why. It's taken ten years of development to to deliver that project. It's earthquake proof. It's hurricane resistant. It meets net zero. It's stronger than any other building. It's lighter. We don't use no wet trade. We've eliminated the use of concrete. It's simple to erect, and we're built into within plus or minus one millimeter. We're developing a system that is manufactured in the factory, and it could be delivered around the world in the simplest component on the horse and cart and can be erected anywhere in the world. The thing with sustainability in developing countries or is that the use of concrete, which is the most pollutant um, material to the atmosphere. So what we use is magnesium oxide Magnesium oxide is a fantastic material. The only problem with magnesium, it comes from China, but every ton of magnesium absorbs 400 kilograms of CO2. So what we're putting together is a panelized system and this demonstration project that we've just completed here in the UK, it meets passive power standards as well. So slowly, the de developing country has to now move away from using concrete and all these pollutant uh, materials to, to meet uh, net zero, because we've got COP26 in the UK coming in October, 
and it's all about net zero. And it's really how does the Caribbean now um, meet net zero, in my opinion. Audley, thank you very much. I wanted to ask Audley, I missed the first session. I don't know if your project was talked about there. Could you drop a link to somewhere where we could take a look at the project in the chat so that everyone could get access to it? Yes, okay, then I'll drop drop a link in the chat then. That's great. So that gives you an idea. It will That's show you how the building is built from beginning to end. And what we've used is women in construction. We're using women in the UK that are putting these buildings up as well, which which is a great thing as well. That's super. Thank you. Thank you, Audley. Patricia, back over to you now. Yes, thank you. I'm so glad Audley spoke because he's one of our AA alum. He was there in the when we were all together at the AA and he's he's UK born but of Jamaican parentage to Winrush. And here it is that here's a graduate with Caribbean roots developing innovation to help and enhance life in the Caribbean region. I just want to celebrate Audley and, and as glad that he made that input. Sorry, I'm Jamaican born. Jamaica. Oh, sorry, Audley. I thought you were UK. No, okay. no, no. I came to the UK when I was five. Okay, awesome. Thanks for clarification. And he's part of the alumni, the Caribbean alumni we're, we're recognizing in this, Christopher. But I really want to thank the, the discussion, the panelists and everyone. Um, but I want to make an intervention because both Rosemary hinted at it and um, Francisco hinted at it, but it was... I think it needs to be specific. My experience in the 2004 Hurricane Ivan, when I went directly to Cayman after the hurricane, I did an investigation of what happened there. And what I found was that a lot of the destruction and demolition, and I heard mention being made about the destruction of timber buildings. The, there were timber buildings which were recently built with the improper material. I heard someone, I can't remember, who said we should be looking at material in the Caribbean. And so there were termites that had eaten up this material. So therefore, they were the first buildings to go. However, the historic architecture remained intact. And the same thing happened in Dominica. I wasn't on the ground in Dominica, but I saw the images of people who were on the ground. They knew I was looking at the heritage. They sent me the picture. Everything else was flat. The heritage building stood. In some cases, some of the heritage buildings had certain joints out of place and needed to be, to be put back. So we're saying that there is already a, a resilience built in to the traditional architecture of the Caribbean. The issue now is that the hurricanes have intensified with climate change. And so the work that I did on the building in the Cayman Islands after the hurricane was to increase the amount of structural connections. So we had to go through and, you know, there's a book called, there's a Simpsons, um, whatever. And we, we just put in a lot of additional with engineers, just put in a lot of ties and a lot of reinforcing to help with, with the connections. So I would want to recommend that as we go through and we train, that we remember the examination and interpretation of our heritage and, and historically, thank you, Francisco, for showing those books. And in the English Caribbean, we go back even to the 18th century and beyond, where people were speaking about the resilience of the traditional buildings and how they watched how the traditional construction was done, especially from the Africans and the indigenous people. And the, the Europeans adopted and integrated these techniques into the development of architecture in the region. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Patricia. Now, hey, Bea, don't cut me off quite yet. I just want to hear what Jenny has to say, and then and then I'll conclude. Okay, I promise. So, Jenny, do you uh, do you want to jump in? Jenny. Okay, I'm going to conclude. Jenny can come back or drop the question into the chat. It's way too yeah, short of a session. I'm here, I'm here. Oh, Jenny, that's great. Jump in. Yeah, sir. yeah no, we, uh, according to what you're talking, um, we do, we did have the Yota hurricane in San Andres and Providencia in November last year, right? 
and um, the Colombian Architectural Society made a competition to reveal the Providencia was um, completely um, destroyed by the hurricane, right? Or like all the all the residences uh, were destroyed. And the, the Colombian Society, Architectural Society made a competition for architects to re, redesign, redesign the, the prototype to be to rebuild all the houses, which were going to be sponsored by some company, right? And uh, that's been going on. Of course, it's been delayed. People are expecting the houses to get built, uh, rebuilt soon. And people are going to help, are willing to help. But what I see coming to our first uh, session was is that it's going to be rebuilt and then the regulations are going to come. So my feeling is that uh, the houses are not, have not been tested properly, I would say, yeah. So the, 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 the houses, are, the prototype, new prototypes, are, the new houses are going to come without a prototype tested. Uh, and I, I'm concerned, I did the competition in, in the office, we did it. And um, maybe I'm, I'm concerned about, do you test the house in, in Hurricanes uh, with so many experiences here in, the, in this meeting? Do you test these houses in Rio Hurricane uh, to test, okay, this is uh, timber, wood, uh, this connection, these other ones, these other ones? Okay, I'll leave that up to that question. Hey, Jenny, thank you very much. And only I'll let you catch up after the kind of words through the chat now. I want to conclude this because otherwise I'm going to throw the entire uh, the entire symposium off. Thank you all very, very much uh, to all of you, all of you who gave talks, all of you contributed. I'm delighted to see the chat going and let's please just build that over the course of this afternoon and this evening. Um, thank you to all of you. One hour and 15 minutes is not enough to discuss, discuss the subject, but uh, thank you again. It was a, a great start to a set of very, very important questions. Um, Bea, I, I think you, you would have normally said that everyone could kind of take a break. But Nuria may want to just kind of jump in here and start. Nuria, are you here? Yes, you are. I can see you. Nuria, yes, do you I want to, do you want to give a five minute break or do you want to just kick right off? I think Beatriz was mentioning in the chat to me that maybe it's better to start right now. Okay. It's going to take like around five minutes <laughs> to set the translation uh, for all yeah. the audience. This third session okay. is going to okay. be Spanish. Um, so. Um, ben and Tom, who are our AV technicians, they will be setting the translation right now. Um, our interpreter this um, afternoon or morning, if you're in the Caribbean, is going to be Lucia. So um, for all the speakers in this third session, please keep the, the pace slow so it, it, you know, um, it's easier for Lucia. But um, yeah. I'll hand it over to Tom and Ben, who are our um, AV technicians, to set the, the translation, live translation. So you will see a feature um, popping up um, on the bottom of your screen in a few minutes that says um, interpretation and then Spanish, English. If you speak Spanish, you can stay and you don't need to do anything, you can stay in this room. If you need English interpretation, you will have to click into the English room and then you will hear Lucia's voice um, speaking in, in English, what the speakers are saying in Spanish. I think that that's clear. If you have any questions or if you have any issues, you can um, ask in the chats, uh, either in Spanish or in English, and we will answer to you. Thank you, Bea. I'm going to uh, say goodbye. It's, well, I'm going to stay, but nice to see so many of my friends here as well. It's really nice to see all of you in one place. Um, Bea, at this moment, I'm going to formally pass over to you and Nuria, and I'm going to just sit and enjoy and listen now. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you, Chris. Okay. Uh, hola, buenas tardes a todos. Uh, soy Nuria Lombardero, arquitecta y profesora de la Architectural Association desde el año 2009 en la Unidad de Diseño Experimental A que comencé tras mis estudios de máster en vivienda y urbanismo. Durante estos años he estado constantemente ligada a Latinoamérica y especialmente a Cuba a través I de... Been linked to Cuba through my work as a teacher. 
my works have been published in various magazines, and this is why I am joining you. Advanced Methodology of Design and the Adaptability. Thank you for being here with us. I am now going to start presenting the speakers. First, Diego Perez Espitia. Hello, Diego, who joins us from Bogota in Colombia. And he's an architect who uh, is interested in procedures, computation, used to architecture. And he graduated in Los Angeles University, Bogota and then joined the DLA group. Throughout his professional career, he has worked in various architectural practices, such as with Zaha Hadid. He has developed projects throughout Asia, Europe, and America. He has given conferences on algorithmic design in Mexico, and Puerto Rico, Istanbul, London, and Xi'an. And he has taught in the universities of Sichuan okay, and Los Angeles. His relationship with AA, he directed the program in Bogota in 2014, and I think he's going to come back to work with us again. Then there is Francisco Gonzalez de Canales, who directs the uh, studio Canales and Lombardero with me. He teaches with me. His work at the AA, he has been in Cuba various times, specifically in La Habana. And this is the presentation we're going to share with you a bit later on. Francisco studied in Seville and in Barcelona and he has worked for various architectural practices. He has taught in various countries and he teaches today now in Spain. He has published various uh, papers and articles. The architect as a worker and recently, Marism and its work in. Together we have published politics and uh, digital fabrication. Then we also have Valeria Guzman from Costa Rica, who I haven't seen for a long time, but I'm happy to see her now. Valeria is a researcher who works on relationships with power in architecture and visual arts. He has graduated at the University of Costa Rica in the architecture. And he teaches at the University of Costa Rica within art, society, and culture. She is a visiting professor in China and in Jamaica. She taught the, at the Architecture Association in Mexico and in Guatemala, and he is a member of Trans-Caribbean Studies Network for Central America and the Caribbean. Her recent publication is China and the National Stadium in Costa Rica. The responsibility of architecture as a gift. And then we have Ingrid Moye, who is in Mexico and who has worked with Sana Neuron. And she has founded Seller and Moy office in Mexico and Berlin. She has taught at the University of Columbia, USA, at the Institute of Arts in Mexico, in Buenos Aires, the visiting school 
uh, of the Architectural Association. Thank you all. And finally, since I want to introduce all those who are part of this session, Maria Arias, who is an architect from Rhode Island Architecture School, and always who leads Tanoman, and she works with design, human experience, and who works in biodiversity. EO2, a social space for innovation, creative process for students, professionals, and the community. Considering the relevance of education, exchange in architecture, professionals, critical thought in design. She has also contributed creative thought and architecture. Thank you all. And we uh, give the floor to Diego, who is going to be the first person to talk to us. Thank you very much. Let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen. Yes, we can. Thank you. Thank you for being here and for contributions. I am going to make a presentation which is goes through a series of principles, advanced techniques in design. And to discuss the work we have done uh, recently in Colombia, they have been uh, done through different <clears throat> ways of production. And through this, I will inform you of various aspects which show how I have tried to uh, uh, show you how architecture can be used as uh, design in, in relation to this conference of the Caribbean. And the circumstances that we have been uh, discussing up to now. It is important to mention that I will talk about these advanced design techniques from the perspective of computation. Understanding this as a way of questioning architecture, interrogating architecture, and to clarify circumstances and the world that we create around them. I will show you different types of works that I have carried out together with the uh, writer practice. And I will show you how these principles then can be uh, treated locally. Computation begins to uh, invest the architectural production with a generative uh, action, a system of rules that start to generate more explicit of these results. We have these machines which design and give us different solutions to the problems which we as designers have to face. And this is how we establish the relations between 
architecture and other disciplines. And I will show you these uh, experiments which look for spatiality and which are based in a basic conception of computation and architecture based in a seminal text. There is a rupture between modern and contemporary as a different way of producing them. And these are the images that I was showing you, which is a visual body of works which expresses itself in uh, different ways. And as I was saying, what we are trying to do is to seek spatiality and to suggest ways in which we can have access to the space in a way that perhaps is where the material is not present. On the other hand, as a second principle, uh, of the things that we have discussed today in relation to computation. This is how we experiment with advanced techniques. And this image that I'm showing you, which is uh, an exhibition in 2014 in Bogota, where we uh, um, used the Python coding and what we're trying to do here is to imagine other points of view, like in this image, which at the moment at the University of the Andes, the students produced this. And what we see here is how these points try to uh, camouflage what is nature and what is artifice. The images uh, are on the right to more simple uh, images which uh, make up the architectural space. At the left hand top, we see how there is a function between computational and artistic and the context that exists and that we see in black and white images where it is almost impossible to define what has been done by an algorithm and what has been photographed. So here is an example. We talk about imagining speculating and see how we can inhabit that world. On the other hand, I also want to mention here and now that computation must be seen as a creative assistant that based on a system of basic rules which enable the designer and the architect to establish uh, relationships both with natural and artificial subjects uh, and to organize systems based on rules, series of rules that define the shape, uh, how they are built and how they are put together. So even uh, children can follow those instructions. So what we're doing here is that these new technologies, techniques which are so advanced are understood as a manner of, as a way of uh, support. We use them as support to find the different accesses and solutions. These are a series of pieces of furniture digital uh, fabrication pieces of furniture which are based principles which are natural working with layers tectonic uh, uh, geology 
uh, certain references to the natural subject and from the rules which regulated beyond formal where what we're looking for here is to use those rules for the natural i want to um, put an emphasis on this because the subject uh, begins to um, grasp these uh, uh, questions that uh, appeared in the previous uh, speakers. What we do here is to understand the rules and to codify them and generate a piece of furniture which begins to uh, generate itself as from those rules. All these that I have shown somehow uh, coincides with the principles of this work uh, done at architectural uh, scale. This work, these buildings, where what we are trying to do is to have one foot in the experimental uh, and this algorithm algorithmic uh, subject, which sometimes goes beyond the needs of the project. Sometimes it generates too much complexity, more than is necessary. But the subject is always to try to take it to architecture and to understand within that context, architecture, what is possible, what is feasible and what is not feasible. In this case, I want to show you what we have done. The reality here is that we very rarely manage uh, coincidence between what you design and what you build. These images, these images in the center show what we try to do on the left and on the right. We show that uh, virtual space. It is from this that I I identify three uh, ways of using what is uh, computer, computer and to use it in the context of the region. The first is uh, almost an obvious truth, but it's something we often forget when you use these techniques, and that is that the algorithm must be an instrument. I have, I, I believe firmly, and I'm showing you examples of factories we built in uh, Bogota and showing the facade in the outside and the inside. And we continue to develop concepts such as the ones I mentioned about those uh, works I mentioned at the beginning of this chat. And I want, but it shows what it is to go inside an industry and outside in the city. These images of these factories is a different way of understanding the system. is to understand the algorithm as simply a sequence which enable us to begin modulating a building. And as I said, this play between the techniques of design and the context uh, where we are, Colombia or the region, is for me, became for me a crucial uh, subject of my work, and it is to understand how it, these techniques, advanced techniques, belong within this context, and how you can make architecture that does not uh, respond to that image of what is contemporary following these principles. When I am trying to establish the shape of a building, there is a sequence of 
uh, computer or a sequence of uh, programmed, which enable me to start molding the use of that building, of the use of the, that space. And, and this is the first road I see to uh, to pay attention to the needs of our uh, projects. This is uh, house in Cali, strictly part of the Caribbean. It, it has various climatic coincidence with the Caribbean because it's very tropical. And I, I come from Bogota, from the city and the mountains, and I found it difficult to understand the subject of water and what rain means in a tropical climate. So here, what I am trying to show you is how those techniques are simplified, reach the most basic, and are modulated in such a way that they respond to these conditions that generally are climactic, although they are not uh, only climatic. See how behind a type of architecture, which is a, uh, modern, and there are behind it algorithmic operations and we go revert to the most basic of the algorithmic, uh, session, which is a sequence to be able to arrive at certain stages. The second way in which one can work is an absolutely separate way, which is separate from the limitations and this is important, I believe, in the Latin American context and the Caribbean context, because it is the possibility of generating a space, a narrative space, which suggests other forms of architecture, where time is a function and where there is an interaction with uh, matters that are not usual in architecture. This is a photograph of a work where with a studio, with a practice where we were um, uh, uh, people who were drawing the voice of this singer and as she sang, a, an architectural space was generated, which generated to that. So it is important to pay attention to social subjects, and we have, must also attend to climate subjects within the relevant context. But it is also important to show how, from these, as from these techniques, architecture has a line of work uh, suggestions of space that don't have the limitations of the physical world. This is a subject of the immersion of the person, those who are within that space. It's a line of work which is very relevant in this context and also separates itself and but complements the third line of work and I feel that we can propose through these techniques of advanced design and it has to do with understanding that this must be put into specific context. This is an image of a workshop we carried out. And in previous 
conferences, uh, reference has been made to this venue where we were uh, we were all in this house made out of bamboo. And what we tried to do was to begin to understand, to attend to these subjects of uh, sustainability and how a material such as bamboo can be the answer to the climatic subject which we have discussed previously. Well, the architect who chose this workshop had access to the subject of bamboo. And what we begin to see here is that other questions arise and maybe the questions might be different. The questions in this context, the context of the Caribbean, what we must do is question architecture from a place that that is not a formality, that is, that does not uh, cooperate, that maybe uh, has no place to generate effects of complexity, which sometimes are legitimized by the image of what is contemporary. In this context then, questions arise how and in which way does architecture need computation? How much does architecture need advanced techniques of design? What is relevant in this context of the Caribbean? What is relevant? What is necessary? There, is, uh, there are challenges, for instance, in Colombia. with all the social problems we have in Venezuela, in Dominican Republic, in Mexico, and Panama, throughout the region, there are very serious challenges. There are challenges which we are not attending to, and they are social. And what we are proposing, and there is a third way in this line of work, and I feel that we can work through that in this context with these techniques. It's a way, and let us start from teaching. And I finish with this image which shows what we have uh, put before you with uh, architects in Panama and Colombia. It's a three year. A program where we're going to use local materials and we are trying to integrate the, that which is digital with local knowledge of materials where the social needs are and the local needs are listened to and the uh, environmental issues as well. The protest is to continue to make suggestions to experiment and create a narrative which uses these advanced tools for design, but at the service of the uh, needs of um, local natural materials such as bamboo, as a sort of uh, re forestation, we have the subject of waters, and this goes through the subject of deforestation. And this is because we do not understand where we are. Panama and Colombia have impressive biodiversity, but what is key is that we are not taking advantage, making use of the of a perfect material. These are recurrent. We talk about hurricanes. We talk about tropical climates, which 
mean that the architecture has to be different. And the proposal is to add the computational techniques and put them at the service of a uh, financial and economic regeneration and that the protection of this biodiversity within this context. In this way, maybe this presentation uh, begins by being a form of interrogation, of questioning architecture. And maybe it puts the subject upside down. And instead of interrogating architecture from the point of view of advanced technologies for design, what we would do is interrogate the Caribbean and its peculiarities through the algorithm and maybe uh, we were talking a little bit about the political and we were talking about the actions of architects and I feel that to a certain extent in the societies of the Caribbean and Colombia there should be the possibility of uh, facing the subject of the environment from the architecture, from the buildings, from action. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Diego. We carry on now with Francisco. Can you see the screen? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, I don't think that my paper uh, deals with all these large subjects, uh, talking about climatic change, uh, the extreme uh, Caribbean climate by itself. But I am going to uh, share with you a particular uh, work we carried out 10 years ago, which is almost a precondition to all the remaining situations. That is, how should we uh, face up to teaching uh, in, to work in groups? What does it mean in the development of any type of architecture and taking the advantage of working in a really alternative context, such as is the case of Cuba, which context which is different to what happens in any other place. So it gives you possibilities of developing work, ways of carrying out things by very alternative means. And this is also the reply to what is happening, was happening at the time. The Fab Labs and digital fabrication have a lot of weight in some professional practices. Some people are using the Fab Lab as a workshop for models, for mock-ups, and they were exploring uh, how to use these tools. And for some people, this might mean such a revolution Patrick Sumacher said that this would be a new style that would revolutionize the way in which we had thought about modern architecture. But about 2010, that what happened was that in spite of this opening uh, to these uh, tools, when we're talking about what was happening in advanced academic centers, the result was very similar. It didn't matter where you were, in which part of the world, in which university, the reality was uh, quite standardized. If you uh, visited at that time many uh, universities uh, which have to do with that, what I am talking about, there are various factors that can uh, be the result of this, the reason for this. There's a autonomous 
uh, generation which is very different with what we uh, when you talk about uses materials etc here what was uh, generational was generative was which had more weight the standard idea that we were talking about topological formations and in those days uh, the ruptures that any uh, design has, such as w w windows and uh, doors. More than the simple standardization that we are talking about that seem to exist in the field of uh, fab labs, uh, we thought that what was important when questioning what was happening was to a certain extent, uh, the, the way of collective working actually was not so direct and so creative as we had thought. So in spite of the fact that in the Fab Labs, you, what, what was promoted, they were promoted as a space for collaboration, the rhetoric continues to, they continue to be uh, old fashioned at the same time that you were talking about collaboration there were uh, i am sorry the sound comes and goes i do it at home individually like a mad genius uh, alone in my garage, it's typical uh, US uh, character. And he gave the idea that any subject could be tackled and re resolved in an individualistic manner without having to depend on a collective. When confronted with this panorama, uh, speculation took place in a territory which is as al alternative as Havana, Cuba, but also the open city, Ciudad Abierta, in Chile. They had the initiative to relocate in, because of the reality, social, political, etc., to uh, go to a more problematic collective. So this is how we work in equipment, these two experiences took place in Ciudad Abierta for a place everybody knows as experimentation and the uh, Echeverria University City in Havana. And what we were trying to do is that it was a collective event, but you had to think of what was diverse and plural and what were the intentions, all this self-referentiation. And uh, what we were interested in at uh, the Fab Lab, there were different positions, there were different ways of understanding the So fundamentally, this alternative concept that could be in, in Havana, you could think the collective work, uh, parametrization for the uh, designs to avoid any conflict. Vinchul has referred to this. This is a process through which things were flattened out to be inserted without resistance. There are operations which have to be subjected to uh, processes of culture. The subject politics and its uh, uh, 
in one of the basic matters to break with this tendency was to stop understanding collective work as something consensual. It can, it can seem strange, but for instance, Anna Arendt understood that it was on the basis of politics and that that is what the title, Politic Fabrication, alludes to. And Chantal Mouflu talks about breaking with the uh, consensualist tradition from another agonistic that which is political has to be seen from a plurality that cannot be reduced to antagonism, positions of enemies and friends. What is democratic uh, has to be plural and has to be able to integrate all these diversities within the same practice. With relation to this definition, Florian Schneider established a differentiation between two models of collective work, collaboration and cooperation. For Schneider, cooperation is understood as a process in which everybody works together in the same direction and in the same purpose. But the fact that they work together in a complex intersection of purposes which are common. And he, Schneider places in this sentence, when facing, uh, co contrary to cooperation, collaboration is, con is led by complex realities rather than romantic notions on a uh, common ground or communality. In this sense, those who are part of the work group are part of a process which is very abrupt and everybody uh, trusts one another this interrelation between dependence and own interest. In this way, cooperation for Schneider is a collective work from consensus. Collaboration for Schneider is collective in conflict where plurality of positions is not reduced. Finally, what happened in Havana It was a 10-day workshop. The important thing is to test these matters, not academically. These workshops were carried out in a context that uh, uh, were important because they had already a load of the Ciudad Abierta of Ritoque, which is part of the Catholic University of Valparaíso, Chile. But so we took advantage of that to create this workshop. But there was a, a huge building. I will talk more about the Echeverria University later on. But it's not possible to forget how the Echeverria University was part of this practice, which meant an, a special ideal between technology, creativity, and uh, material possibilities in the tropical modernity of Latin America with all its projects, which were almost utopic, which started to take place in those uh, six years, the 60s, the decade of the 60s in the island and the development of the School of Art. In the case of the Echeverria uh, University, it was a far more technological uh, project and it was done through a method which is inspiring for us. Uh, it, uh, people who worked in it, Juan Tosca, Selma Soto, and the development of a prefab system called SMAC system of multiple application in Cuba, which 
meant that you produced in situ the slabs and then lift them into some uh, columns that, uh, and fix them there so that in this manner the prefabrication took place in the same place. The relevance of this is that it's a technological prefabrication and it should result. It is, uh, on the one hand, um, uh, technological, but also uh, artisanal. And so I think what was interesting was the way in which you could adapt with the new technologies to these contexts, which were so alternative. In the case of Cuba, it is especially unusual uh, within the Caribbean context. The workshop, the first thing it had as a difficulty, you couldn't have a concrete building. It was the impossibility to find materials. In Cuba, this was an extreme situation. It's a romantic idea of recycling materials, but everything that could be recycled had already been recycled once or twice. There is no material that uh, you can recycle in Cuba. So anything that you could use had to come in your suitcase from London to Havana. So that was what we put inside our suitcase. And the only way in which we could build was uh, here, 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 here we have all the materials on the bed that we, where we stayed, and this is what we we're going to use. The equipment also, that idea that each one can contribute his own subjectivity. The equipment was formed by students from Chipre, Italy, Mexico, Cyprus, Spain, uh, and Cuban artists. But unfortunately, they cannot uh, connect because of what uh, the problems of uh, connecting to the internet in Cuba and the uh, proposal and the the project took place not just with the students and the professors. We have to understand that this building uh, is. Uh, we, we needed uh, consensus. And finally, it was decided <laughs> to have a pavilion in, uh, inspired in the paintings of Wilfredo Lam, which caused great impact on the students and this pavilion would be uh, useful to uh, give uh, to lessons. And then you could have the classes projected on the roof. As I said, the plurality of how you do things was born from the uh, technologies that we would have that were uh, developed in Europe. So it's a mixture between high tech and low tech. All the surface was carried out practically with the grasshopper, which which is a tool for uh, cutting up. But you couldn't manufacture digitally, so we ha we used the projector we had brought, video projector, and on it we extended a fabric, a cloth, and then after marking it by pencil, we cut it up. Each one did his sewing uh, uh, in their own manner. The director of the school herself contributed and everybody uh, built their own bit, like those Afro-American either downs that are made by various people. But it was all part of this collective. Here we are seeing part of how it was being assembled, mounted. We had brought all this 
uh, material, it was not enough. So we had to uh, ask for an exchange. Uh, we had some mesh, which was sort of silver, and we changed, we exchanged them with tablecloths. We gave them this uh, mesh and they gave us the tablecloths. And this is how we managed to uh, finish the uh, work. Uh, uh, tensions with cables, tensions with, with ropes. There are different ways, there were different ways of doing things, different way of sewing, and it shows how each one contributes through his own intuition, his own needs within a project that is a collective project. Um, finally, what I would like to point out is that rather than solving great problems like you were talking about before, this exercise is part of a precondition how we must face up to certain design programs. Sometimes because of uh, need, we end up doing something which is architecturally very top down and which uh, has uh, been made correct. Everything that is going to be incorporated into society should have this plural and diverse dimension. Uh, and this we have to teach the students how to think these solutions, which is neither good nor bad. But I want to go into this debate on how to carry out and to not to <sighs> make everything into a parametric calculation, the possibility of carrying out the project, the resistance to purely digital solutions. And to go beyond negotiation, error, unforeseen curvature, excess of tension, change of materials because of scarcity. I'm sorry, the sound has gone. In this meeting with reality, with the way in which you have to work, that is not failure, but the line of exploration and different ways of building which overlap with others which end up by uh, bringing about uh, the most um, uh, ideals in force. Uh, uh, thank you, Francisco. We're going to have a five minute break and then Valeria will talk to us. Thank you. Bueno, pues damos paso a Valeria. We give the we give the word. We give the floor to Valeria. Hello. Hello to everybody. It's a pleasure to see old friends and make new friends. I am going to share the screen. Can you tell me if you can see the screen properly? Yes. Before starting, I would remind you of the person of Mark Cassins, who has left a, a legacy of the 30 last years of the Architectural Association. For the past 15 years, a new architecture built by means of uh, uh, concessional loans uh, between Chile, uh, China and uh, the Caribbean. Uh, they are building uh, all over the Caribbean. The case of Jamaica is of particular interest because according to Richard Berner, it was the entrance uh, door and launch pad for diplomatic and financial uh, relationships between China and the Caribbean in the uh, present century. 
there is there was a jointly finances by diplomatic component there is a policy of one china only and the financial economic project the formula talks about these uh, loans credit uh, lines and using their building companies to build these projects so by means of this formula the chinese firms which are part of this uh, have greater uh, markets and i propose uh, uh, to talk about this in the Caribbean and from an architectural expanded uh, to describe what is part of this uh, type of cooperation. In Jamaica, the formula was uh, called uh, gifting architecture and there were uh, loans for the building of the stadium and the constructions in Montego Bay, which was completed in 2011. The uh, uh, architecture that was gifted was part of what is known as prestigious projects, modest size, according to Chinese standards, which they could be built very quickly and efficiently, following the turnkey uh, project. So they do the design and the building of the project. In the Caribbean, the Cricket uh, 2007 uh, Cricket Club was used as a multiplier for these uh, stadia arena built by uh, the Chinese in Antigua, Jamaica, Grenada, in Bahama, Santa Lucia, and Dominica. The implementation, rapid implementation, has been a crucial part of this type of architecture since uh, speed and efficiency are important both for for both parties. In China, some of these projects, which are not called prestigious projects, but projects for external help, aid, have been part of a very important part of architecture abroad. But quantity does not mean quality in architectural terms. In China, the the projects in China are judged for their engineering, but not for their design. They can be built at a very uh, quick pace. They don't pay tax. We don't know who are the people who decided this in Jamaica and China. And there was a lot of uh, criticism in Jamaica because of uh, its use after its construction. The fact that other cases in the region also generated this uh, criticism would seem to indicate that these uh, prestige uh, projects were uh, not really part of a more beneficial um, uh, projects for the island. This formula, diplomacy, finance, and construction uh, is for the space-time colonial. It creates alternatives for other times, spaces. Maybe the question here would have more weight, not only because China has been the greatest production provider of finance in Jamaica for their projects, but also because the accelerated rhythm, which is intrinsic of the know-how of Chinese enterprises, and this was articulated by means of the uh, 
uh, accelerated building that China has experienced in the 40 past years. Time and speed are very important points. I would like to tell you of three variables of these architectures with concessionary loans are produced in the space. The first variable, the loans with the um, Chinese government are made through various banks. One is the Export Bank of China, which helps China to obtain uh, um, business outside China, and it does uh, these uh, concessionary loans with low interest. It is uh, particular when a Chinese company invests avoid the central institutions can absorb that risk by mean the diversity of portfolios in different countries. That was the case of Complas, which built uh, the, that center in Montego Bay in 2011, and three sugar plants uh, belonging to the Jamaican government. This would bring the price of sugar down and there would be a rehabilitation of the refineries to produce great uh, success. It ended in failure. Uh, one of these plants is looking for a buyer. The cycle of selling and buying land is a mechanism that doesn't not generate alternatives for those who inhabit the island, but also space time for the project, uh, diversification of the investment distributed uh, according to the Chinese banking policy, the success and the failures of these uh, companies uh, which have been uh, backed by China, but do not take into account what can happen to the uh, local environment. Second variable, ways of payment. China says they can absorb all these uh, loans, but that does not mean that the loans must not be repaid. For instance, uh, the, the road between Ocho Rios and Kingston in Jamaica, a project that was abandoned by the French and the government of Jamaica negotiated a loan for, the build, for building uh, this uh, highway with uh, to uh, with Chinese the Chinese government and a ch Chinese uh, company without going through a public tender and the 485 hectares of land would be part of the payment in spite of the fact that the hectares in the northern coast of the island in St. Catherine, which are premium, the cost was uh, calculated without uh, making the right calculations. Because at the time of the negotiation, it had not been decided what was going to be part of the payment, what land was going to be part of the payment. So, we're talking about reordering the space time of the island. The general manager of the highway was talked about the ancillary developments where we see the potential long term. The payment of the doubt is a project which is spaced and temporal. The third variable. In spite of the 
confidential nature of the negotiations throughout the years, there has been resistance to the implant implementation of these practices in the island. In 2017, the first minister of Jamaica announced that there was a memorandum of understanding between the government of China, the Urban Development Corporation, which is the official body, and the China America uh, Construction Company for the building of this uh, cam for a campus and the modernization of the National Heroes Park, which includes the Jamaican Parliament, uh, various buildings for ministries, public space, etc. The second phase. Uh, includes development of uh, Kingston, a marina for cruise ships. When this memorandum was uh, announced, uh, brought about a serious debate. The civil society questioned this project. It uh, rejected the way the financing was being carried out local uh, competent architectures and engineers were cast aside. And in a project such as the Parliament of Jamaica, and they complained about uh, not taking into account what was already there and the parliament should not be located in the space of this park, which is one of the only ones in the area. But lastly, no public consultation, no transparency in the process of negotiations brought about a conflict, an open letter to the first minister. Also had to do with uh, uh, the architect, which was interesting. There was this rejection, and, and it was a letter by the College of Fellows of the um, Jamaican architects who were saying that the greatest benefit that Jamaica would receive was a huge debt. The critics criticism and the pressure by the architects and the builders and other members of civil society uh, meant that the project of the parliament had to was uh, put out to tender this change of direction of what they consider the public uh, project most important is independence was positive because it meant that the changes to the city and uh, brought about a discussion, a debate for, for, for the city, for the architecture, for buildings of symbolic value. For others, the center of the discussion, talking about downtown Kicktoon and the models for financing was was lost along the way. It is possible to appreciate how far we are uh, architecture with uh, concessional loans is not uh, is, is metaphorical. These are technologies for accelerated construction and mechanisms for the future of the investor who are reorganizing the the life and the materials and death in the island it, this is what is considered that uh, how uh, black people were used by europeans and we're talking uh, this open letter is not uh, an isolated matter, but something of great importance internationally in diplomacy. The uh, 
but it is considered a temporal space violence and it has to do with colonial space time. We are talking about loss, past, present and future. And as Ferreira da Silva says, it, the, the people are marked by a debt that they cannot cancel. If we talk about climatic vulnerability, not only of the Caribbean region, but of all the small insular states which are under development, what architecture do we want to build? I leave it here so, so that um, we can um, carry on. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Valeria. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. It doesn't show me the option of using full screen. Normally it shows this function, but it's not coming up. This is very strange. Anyway, let me try once more. Here we are. Can you see my screen? Yes. Thank you very much, Architecture Association, for this space, to Beatriz for organizing it, and to all those in the panels, to uh, Nuria for this specific panel. And I would like to link this with Valeria's words, where she talked about prestige. Uh, projects, but this is a project in Mexico done very differently by the government, which, and this I say with great pride, because it is a project done by the government together with architects, and it is a project that has been carried out with Infonavit, which is the institution of social housing in Mexico by Ming de Sips, which is the Center for Investigation for Sustainable Development. And what they were seeking was uh, they went to Mexican architects and international architects as well, 32 architects. And each architect was assigned a municipality of the country. And the job was to do a prototype of housing which was specific to that place, rural, not social, but rural. And what was interesting is that we're talking about housing. It is not a development typical of social housing, which is what is normal. But here, the, the Infonavit was looking for us to do a system of work in which we were going to be assigned a family, specifically a budget and a specific um, terrain. And we had to be very um, flexible. This is just to give you the context of what rural housing is in Mexico. I wanted to emphasize what is the, the, rural, the link between the rural and the urban when there are networks of work, of dependency, of codependency between these two areas, rural and urban. And they are linked, although the realities are very different. So this is why I thought it was very important to think what is the housing, not only of social interest uh, in the urban context, but also in the rural context. And one of the first things we did was to study what exists in these already, uh, in these uh, housings, self-built of social interest, uh, also through Imponavit. And what we think is interesting here and what we understood was the strong relationship between what was built 
that is the closed inhabitable space with the outside space and vegetation. So this is one of the most important interrelations for us. And this is repeated in different schemes. Other, another important point, this shows you that. You can see the permeability of something that exists already. The relationship is very strong with that which is inhabitable, but also an important social aspect. What is social has a human uh, sense. Uh, people want to extend their homes towards outside uh, to talk to those who go by. And I thought this was very interesting. And from a point of view of uh, the programming of these observations that we made in this municipality of Colima. We were sent to, we were award assigned in Colima, Coquimatlan, which is the municipality within Colima. And in this specifically something which uh, the called our attention is that the architectural uh, program is not contained within the four walls of the house, but it expands, is open up to gardens. And here, for instance, there is a hammock. They not only sleep in their beds, they sleep in their hammocks. The children play in the trees. People wash their clothes outdoors. And I think it's very important as this first step of our approach to the design is to observe this type of activities and architecture, architecture that existed already. For instance, the kitchen, not everybody has a gas stove in their homes, but the, the log uh, stoves, which can have to be used outside, function very well. A lot of people cannot have gas, it's too expensive, but also there is another aspect which is very important, and that is that in Mexico and throughout Latin America, social relations, interaction when you are cooking is fundamental. So that is has also to be taken into consideration. So we propose to Infonavit, instead of designing a home, a house, we were going to decide a module, and that module was going to be it's a module we designed, and on the basis of this module, you can propose, we can propose a system depending on the budget of the family, of the grounds, the soil, the number of the members of uh, the number of members of the family, and also what is very important that these houses or this system, shall we say, or this methodology of design would enable a horizontal or vertical uh, growth. Because as you know, in Latin America and in Mexico, families are not like European families. In Mexico, uh, Latin America, uh, people live with their extended family. You might live with your grandmother or with your cousins or with various generations, but also people build uh, little by little. It is not like when there are big budgets and somebody designs a house uh, to their taste. And so when you have uh, little money, you build a little. When you have a little bit more money, you add. So this is why we designed this model as uh, um, it's, it's, it's made with concrete. And this is for a social and cultural and psychological reason. In a, in a earthquake prone zone such as Colima, it is very important. People have an idea and understanding that if you give them an adobe house, it's going to uh, fall. But if you have a house made out of concrete, they are going to feel safer. It is rigid, it supports the, it resists, uh, says, make movements, and you can also add various levels. So we combined various things. You fill these blocks with a material, whatever it is, 
it can be a cement block, it can be an adobe block, and there are these pergolas, these windows, which we propose were made of adobe. There is a, a staircase that can be added. And when the house is not growing, you can use it as a um, roof terrace. And this, on the basis of what we design, let us have a typical case, let us design a typical house as a study house. And through this module, we produce this configuration. On the one hand, sustainability, very basic, very simple, which are to enable the circulation of air, which form a microclimate, apart from the relationship of what has been built with the uh, vegetation. This garden, which is as important as the house itself, seeks to create a microclimate which uh, um, improves the atmosphere and the natural uh, sunlight, but, on, but we also use terraces and pergolas to uh, uh, regulate the entry of the sunlight. So the design we proposed what we did was connect a direct connection between the landscape and the architecture. That is, this house is as important as the landscape. And each one of these modules relates directly with that. So when programming, the kitchen in the part that is enclosed always has uh, an extension, a, a sort of... Um, patio and garden. So what you see here is the fixed uh, furniture. Um, th this was built in concrete and people can live in their garden, in their plot, extending the program, which is not limited to the square meters that you can build, but is to do with the ground itself. And the same is for the bathroom and for the bedrooms. This is the idea of the garden, uh, not only for climatic reason, but for uh, programming reasons. And here we have the idea in this prototype, in this configuration of how you could uh, then uh, grow the house, be it horizontally or vertically in a single plot. The next step was that once we developed the whole project to executive level, Infonavit took the decision before starting to implement these uh, houses to generate a, an investigation laboratory which investigated, researched housing and in which it could build the 32 proposals, design proposals for e of each architect with a design uh, laboratory. And this uh, Apan Hidalgo, which is far away from Colima and with very different climatic conditions, but that was not the point. The point was to generate this laboratory to see the context, to see it is also rural, and here is each one of the prototypes. So this is a very interesting exercise because I think it gives us a good sample. The government did the right thing to, and it cooperates with architects to design and to promote how you can build housing with limited budgets and with rural conditions social conditions with an open program and how each architect can arrive at a different uh, approximation and, uh, and, uh, with these concepts of uh, how to approach it. And I think it's very interesting. And this is a uh, construction, the uh, concrete uh, structures where the concrete is 
something that is used a lot in Mexico. And this is how we filled with adobe because of the thermal conditions for this climate such as that of Colima. And also another subject which is in these regions, rural regions, to work with adobe is a tradition which is about to be lost. And we thought we, and we were interested in bringing it back, bringing back that um, Uh, and, and it was difficult because the, the builders, the construction company, didn't want to do it. They said, nobody works with Adobe anymore. It'll be difficult to find the workers, etc. And this was a bit disruptive. And we had to teach people the technique or bring people who knew the technique, which was local. So something which we, I, I thought was very good, the construction of the project was that this idea of the Mexican family and the Mexican acti attitude to be together outside with your family, with friends, to having your meals. The workers used our table to eat and to rest. So it was rather lovely that they, they, they were occupying it. They were using it as we had visualized it. And here is the built uh, prototype. And you can see here how this fixed uh, furniture is part of the house. So normally it's seen as something that comes afterwards. And in this case, Where we have three concrete objects. One is this table. The second is this uh, stove, uh, wood stove, and the third is this a uh, sort of fountain, uh, something that is used a lot in Latin America because you can collect rainwater there. It's not used that much now, but. I think it's very important to bring it back. And another thing which is very important is to collect uh, rainwater, uh, which is not collected in uh, drainage and tubes, but it is uh, used that it goes directly into the terrain. So we are uh, avoiding a cost and we're also simplifying Uh, and preventing the saturation of the networks. This is a prototype which has already been built and you can visit it if you come to Mexico. I think it's rather interesting. And here you can also see the, the, the doors we tried, we, we chose bamboo because in Colima there is a lot of bamboo, but also it gave us the opportunity to generate Uh, the passage of air and the uh, sunlight because it, it can be very hot. So you can use the, the top uh, and these are the what we call pergolas which open up and the intention of these is to cr create the microclimate but also to generate views and on the other hand to be able to generate the shadow shade what was a very good experience as well with this period is that last year it won the biennial for pan american architecture of quito and we won first place in minimal architecture which is a very small uh, category it's a very small project so i think uh, it was interesting to to contrast with the contrast with valeria who was talking about these huge chinese pro, uh, projects by the chinese and uh, such a little project such a minimal participation can have we can at least attempt to have an impact a positive impact in a social, cultural, and ecological context. And that's it. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Ingrid. We are opening up to the debate now, and I would like Mia to tell us a little bit about her work because she talks about human experience, creative projects, and then after, uh, and then then talk about uh, minimum scale, construction, creative process. Can you tell us a little bit about your work in Panama so that then we can go into the debate with the speakers? Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and the possibility of uh, discussing with you. John Miller, who invited me, I think it was incredible to listen to all these uh, speakers. And I want to start by trying to put together all these stages of architecture that we have been talking about as from a uh, human scale and the potential of the human impact. We talk about natural disasters and architecture and to find solutions. And we are talking about architecture as from space and other scales of fabrication of technology, innovation. And what does it all mean? It means, what does it mean advanced technologies, design advanced technologies? To ask if that session was going to be only about technology, which is not my forte. And yet it is good to be able to think of the word innovation and design as that potential of architecture to generate a change and to have that alternative methodology to do things, remembering also what Mark said right at the beginning, that as an arch architect, we have the potential to carry out these changes, but we have to uh, join that uh, debate. But to tell you about my work, to what I do in Panama, it has to do with the scales of architecture and the potential of architecture as a tool for change. We, I started working in 2012 in Taroma, which means uh, architectural uh, workshop origin. I don't mention it, it's just collective space. It was a space for everybody. Uh, it is always going to be a collaboration. Usually they have the name of the architect, the surname of the architect. I did not want that. So in practice, we have worked a lot in the private sector, which we have always done with uh, uh, great uh, glee. We go into it uh, full time, but I, we always also wanted to do something different to be able to generate that impact uh, with the because of the potential of architecture. So in 2019, we decided to generate this uh, lab, which is a social innovation lab, and we see it as a um, as a branching out, and it deals specifically, basically, with this space that we need so much space to generate that challenge of the creative thought, uh, questioning architecture, as Diego said, and to question constantly what we are doing. And as we're doing something different at any scale, it can be designing interiors, it can be architecture, it can be urban planning. And this is a wonderful thing of architecture that you can always create an experience which is different. You can always do effect a change at any uh, level, at any change. So, Theo, what uh, fraction inspired by oxygen, and it is used to give oxygen to those who do not have oxygen in their bodies. Why were we inspired by that? Because in these spaces that we were trying to create were spaces for our creative minds, uh, oxygenation of our creative minds, and they developed uh, on the basis of five pillars. One is the students who are the seeds, and we wanted to create these ephemeral 
a temporal spaces which happen with no fixed time and can happen anywhere, but which involve the students and involves the professionals. And we are joined in this same uh, space, people of, at different levels to awaken critical thought in design to think outside the box, to think differently, and to uh, raise the matter of how important architecture is and everything that we do at every scale, whether very small to very large, from a very small scale to very uh, large uh, changes. The other pillar was a space for professionals who Com which combines uh, as cooperators, different colleagues, uh, independent practices, different professions, but all creating a formal space for dialogue, for debate, to generate solutions which contribute to the city, to the community, and also looking a space where we can share our knowledge because we're always going to have to learn one from the other. And this is the result of this is going to be better creative products, which are going to be part of our environment. And in this space, we also talk about what happens in our countries, rules, politics. And I think that we have to, we do have to get into politics, not become politicians, but we have to make, take decisions which, uh, uh, a part of our environment and, and we have to participate in the area of community and this is we have created these collaborative spaces. The other is community uh, work with the community but also through design the creative process which in, involves various people who deal with their own environment collectively. We talk about urban architecture, which seeks to have this impact as well in small projects, which are going to manage to connect and to have that social conscious, that social responsibility, which we seek. And finally, um, uh, competitions for design, which have to be carried out in, in Panama. We have... Um, tenders which have to do with construction and there isn't that care from the beginning to end of the design for the project so the the competition is to give it that potential as a tool for innovation and to uh, use that in our environment. So we started with this small lab about three years ago and it is uh, basically an architecture lab because architecture can bring about a big change and we cannot do it alone and we can do so many large things and to do it all at the same time. So we designed this environment as a way of um, bringing to life that which revives us through this uh, ambient atmosphere the space with also having our private projects which uh, the, the, the uh, group oxygenates that project it makes us um, better uh, architects and, and thank you for the invitation and thank you for listening to me uh, because this is very important to have this opportunity to have this debate with you to create this impact outside the local and into the global and there is so much to learn from each other and it would be wonderful to be able to exchange in the future uh, always seeking to improve our uh, practices as to just thank you there's a lot of things in common the scale architecture to be related to construction, to large companies, as Valeria mentioned, the political, the financial, the design, the possibilities of having an impact. So if anybody else wants to say something or react to Mia's words, or does anybody have a, a, 
a question or do you want to talk through the chat? Valeria, do you want to say something? Patricia, do you want to say something? I would like to add something which relates to the project that I mentioned and to our uh, role. You talk about the role of the architect, architect and also the role in the relationship with the government. In our case, the project that we did with Infonavid, which is the social housing of Mexico, was rather special because there was a good team within that institution and it enabled, it allowed the architects to design and to work and to think with the government. It was a really extraordinary experience, especially in the context of Mexico. And now, what I think the negative part of this is that these projects which you saw were done under a government and now we've had a change of government and these projects are left there and there is a new government and you don't talk about these projects anymore it has been built etc but unlike europe where governments have a, a continuity of work. The projects have far more, uh, are far more settled and have more continuity. But I think it has to do with a political subject. It has to do with political subjects and what Mexico is and the systems and the administration. But I think that this is a difficult part as architects, many examples of this exist. One could be the airport of Mexico City, which was a very polemical uh, project designed by Norman Foster, uh, which was about 30% about to be implemented, about to be built. The government changes, there's a new, and then backwards. And it has, I don't want to be political, uh, whether I, uh, I don't want to say that I'm with one party or another. I just want to say that from the point of view of an architect, I give you the example of Norman Foster. These projects could be little uh, like mine or big like Norman Foster's airport. Uh, how do we manage that continuity? how can uh, projects have a longer life in Latin America? Because in Europe, I see that there is far more coherence, consistency, continuity. Francisco, do you want to say something? Uh, Valeria, I know you lifted your hand, but let me have a word, please. I want to say something very straightforward. In the frameworks in which we are working as architects are so constricted because of economical, because of political, because of financial um, situations that in many cases it all depends on whether we uh, do uh, take action which is weighty, which is collective. I don't know all the cases, but for instance, if in Spain, that continuity, continu maybe maybe it's a perception, but uh, when you see that something doesn't work, uh, Sahar Hadid's uh, library, 30% built here in Seville, this happens, this keeps happening. But I wanted to say is that there have been periods where there has been care for the city, care for the public spaces, for the type of space of uh, constructions that were being built because the social sector and the architectural sector, the College of Architects have um, been heard, have expressed their things. In Barcelona, Madrid, Seville, Santiago de Compostela and many cities, they have expressed their concern and and the participation of architects in the poli political sphere. We talk about politicizing, but uh, certain values uh, 
have to be met. It, it, it's difficult in, within the framework in which we are working. I never thought that we had to undervalue the, that there should be a certain presence of people who isn't who are interested in in architecture in in the city and and who are who have a political weight and the uh, architect's role is very limited and sometimes you can do good things in very uh, discreet uh, ways if the sometimes very pompous things are carried out because they're uh, uh, hyperstructure. Infrastructure is a place is a place from where we should attack. It is a place from where we can work. It, it's all very difficult. Thank you, Francisco Valeria. Yes, I wanted to make two contributions, two things that I think are there and have been mentioned have to do with scale. I think that a, an interesting challenge that we have as architects is the possibility of thinking in multiple scales. It's almost an, uh, compulsory and imperative. It's to do with size, with dimensions, but as we were talking, around all this I th all day it's in relation to time temporal scales apparently are very important how far the project goes what are the possibilities of the project uh, two weeks ago more or less I was listening uh, to a speaker who was talking about the planners in the US who are who plan blocks of time the planning is not in terms of space but in in terms of time a block of time to do this a block of time to do this uh, we need time for one year for this two years for that 50 years for that and in re and and then the decision is reached in relation to the time which is uh, in which you are involved and in which you invest so so to move in uh, temporal and spatial scales seems a very interesting challenge Valeria knowing that in Caribbean this temporal space is different from that in Europe does anybody else want to make a contribution I would like to make a comment with relation in relation to what Valeria was saying talking about the city and the society and the time and the, the, the scale temporal or spatial it has to do with the power of the architect the larger the project from the point of view of space or temporally the architect has less power and this takes us somewhere which is very interesting and that is to be able to uh, have an input into society as from very small matters within the framework of planning is very interesting that in 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 cities of the caribbean the colombian uh, caribbean those of uh, those uh, the things that we don't know carry on but it is possible to make very small interventions such as maria informed earlier which can be an example of that can be repeated and we talk about projects ex carried out within the framework of very extreme context a small intervention changes the notion of 
architecture, that which is public, that is uh, for community. I think there is a road because our powers is proportional to that and also a way of not being um, limited because the, 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 everything is handled by political, economical, financial and things that we do not know with which we have no relation. I think Mark Taylor uh, wants to say something and then Mia. Mark. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to give Diego a, a little understanding of some of what we have to deal with. Um, our politicians might go on a trip to uh, Singapore and they see these beautiful buildings, the skyline. And they come back and say, Kingston, oh yeah, in the tropics, we need to have our city look like Singapore. So we're going to now start building high rise. So you come to Kingston right now and there are tower cranes. We look like Dubai looked 20 years ago. We have tower cranes everywhere. Everybody wants to build the next 15 story, 20 story. So we have the man who, one of the designers of the Burj Khalifa, who is a Jamaican, who is now designing the tallest building, is to be the tallest building in the Caribbean. Now, Singapore doesn't have hurricanes very often. In fact, probably four in their entire time. They don't have earthquakes. We have to design to California codes for earthquakes and Florida codes for hurricanes. And as we get them bad, both. But we want to build 20-odd story buildings. So every architect now, I mean, the, the economy, it's a very strange thing that has happened. But it's not, look, the politicians don't know any better. Sorry. I mean, maybe you have educated politicians in your country. We don't. <laughs> uh, so we need to educate. And part of our job is, you know, it's advisors to politicians who are the important people. And it should be us. It should be us. And when we go, we shouldn't be talking political things. We should be talking sensible things. And right now at this time, they're telling people, but we're building housing. You know, I mean, it's housing for everyone. How many people can afford to buy million dollar US houses in high rise apartments? They might look beautiful, they might be wonderful, but this has all of a sudden become a priority. And this little town is now spending all its resources doing this because the politicians are staring you that way. They've broken all the codes. Their codes, the codes written, are now just removed if you want to build a high-rise building. Now, that's what we're dealing with. Small island developing states struggling with economic issues I think that that is a different um, scenario. I, I know local things in Europe play out different things, but this is when I talk about the politics. That's what I'm talking about. It's understanding that's missing. And it is our job. We have to struggle through this and try to educate the populace. I'm talking sometimes, it's the last one. Little people, little people. I go on building sites. And I saw when I was just trying to fix a friend's roof and I saw the builders and I said to them, I looked at it and I started to talk to them about their job because they were missing hurricane straps on what they were doing. And I explained to them, I said, it is not the contractor. It's not the, the firm that's important. You are the person who does the work. If you miss a screw, that roof is going to fly off. So I see my job in societies such as ours, where many people doing the jobs are undereducated, are in fact illiterate, to also help them to grow. The result of that conversation was that all of them called me aside afterwards and said they would like to work for me because nobody had ever spoken to them like that before. 
about their job in building. Seeing people struggle with stone, trying to break a stone, and to explain to them from your point of view how to find the seam and strike it, and the stone opens. And maybe not every architect has those experiences. I have spent a lot of time on building sites and learned from good builders. I did it in the UK and I did it in Jamaica, in different parts of the world. But our job is to educate not just architects, but the people who do the work for architects in, and the politicians in ways to help to change this thing. And I believe, honestly, that's the way we're going to get change in small societies. So I sound evangelical and I'm not religious, but so it is. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Uh, thank you for explaining us uh, the possibilities of being an agent no? as an architect. So Mia, if you had your hand raised, can you, what, what you would like to add here? See, si, uh, do I speak in English or Spanish? <laughs> I carry on in Spanish. And referring to what Mark was saying, the subject of education as architects and to be able to learn to uh, learn to use the different languages. What we seek is that healthy, positive uh, environment. And I think it's very important if uh, in the subject of uh, politics, all our governments are different, but when we consider things are not being done properly, when there is corruption, this is why we are so scared of politics. But it, it is important to when they take decisions, to they articulate regulations, but at the end of the day, when you understand the importance of those regulations, those rules, are part of our environment, that that is what is going to regulate how our space is built. We have to raise our voice, we have to become relevant, and we have to show how the way we think creatively, critically, uh, builds that environment. And that environment it goes from all the scales that we're talking about, spaces, tangible spaces, uh, we talk about performance, that what Diego was talking about, something as abstract as that, talks about the culture, the space that is completely different and that changes the expression, how fabricating uh, uh, an article, how this changes the uh, perception of a space of architecture and how do we do when our work, when we change the quality of human life, the, the quality of the life of people, who are the recipient. And so the role of the architect must be raised to this potential of change of what we, we are doing it, but we have to be more active and we have to connect more with politics. I know it's difficult because it's very frustrating because of what is going on, but if we don't go into that arena and do nothing, uh, is wrong. But we have to start by by little particip participation to show that community through that collectivity that we, we can talk about recycle, we can talk about sustainability, we can talk about uh, innovation in construction of materials, when we talk about bamboo, for instance, all the themes and practices that we have within our profession and the potential we have to influence that change if we activate with, uh, within our environment from different points of view. It is doing things we are doing, uh, uh, raising the voice of the architect to, to do art, to generate an experience, to do something different, to have a positive environment. I think that it is very important, as Mark said, to educate and to show that potential that we have to make that difference. We have Audrey and then Francisco, and then we conclude and we give the word to Beatrice. Audley, when you are ready. Oh, can you hear me now? Si, yes, we can hear you. Oh, oh thank you. Um, today I found it very interesting 
And the thing that I've noticed is there's no consistency from one area to the other. Everyone is trying out different things. And um, I was just looking at Diogo's um, schemes and I thought how brilliant they were using parametrics. And that just reminded me, going back to the AA, when John Fraser started the first computing unit at the AA and everyone looked at it and said, that's crazy. And then Zaha, um, when she set up her practice and she started using parametrics, you know, and which is now taken over by Patrick, you know, and they, they seem to be pushing the boundaries. And then you look at the end of year exhibitions around the UK, and then every school now is using computer in a big way, you know, helping to solve the, the issue. So it's just amazing how technology has gone, gone ahead now when we used to use the pencil um, to draw with. And going back to uh, Barret's um, comment on the Chinese providing the end-to-end -end, um, service, one-stop service, well, what we do in the UK here is that we've had to use an end-to-end -end solution with our supply chain because then we are guaranteed that we can use, that we're getting quality because everyone in the supply chain is familiar with our product, and then we, that's the way that we can control um, the quality. And then Zela mentioned about the adaptable houses. You know, we've, we've developed our house that we call the Flexi House, that as the family grows and the income increases, um, then, then you can add to it, you know, that's why we call it the Flexi House. And going back to what Mark said about... Um, these politicians, you know, now building um, high-rise building, which is out of context of the of the Caribbean environment. I think back over here on the politicians, they they want to leave behind some form of legacy. They don't care what they leave. They want to leave a legacy behind, and and I think that might be now creeping into into the Caribbean. But I found it a very interesting day. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so Francisco, uh, try to be brief and then we finish with you and Beatriz will, will take a... No, simplemente... I simply would like to add that I agree with many of the matters that have been brought up, but also I understand that in many cases, for instance, when we were talking about uh, um, small scale that can generate big changes, it is true that that can happen, but we have also seen in the Latin American context a lot in very intensely in the last few years how this type of strate strategy has been used in a very superficial, relatively superficial manner. Uh, many times we have not been able to generate these changes that were promised in many uh, contexts in Caracas, in Mexico. And I've uh, cooperated with this type of practice in Querétaro, for instance, and I understand that in many occasions you don't manage these changes because you, you, have, you need a collective uh, will. And in that sense, we are always giving uh, blame to the politicians, to something which is outside us. But we must understand that we are also part of the political life. And if we are not conscious of it, this is why we are in this type of situation where we are constantly uh, confronting situations which we think we are facing up to that we are tackling but really in our work it's a really like a, a little cosmetic element to to make up the how precarious situations are I would be very careful with that way of facing things 
and is in the strategy as Valeria was saying, I think that what she said was very interesting to seek parameters that are alternative to the ones that are being used and to see in what control we can have over that and to put forward alternatives, but a very complex matter as Audley said, it is obvious that each one of us came from a totally different position and this in the end maybe is what produces a greater lack of consolation, but greater fascination and I missed a word, the future that we can have. Beatrice, uh, the floor is yours but i want to thank all the speakers and uh, mia who was part of the panel and all the participants of all these sessions maybe beatrice is the right person to bring to a close thank you nuria thank you all for being present here today for speaking for making presentations ideas and to discuss from the urban to the rural and from the small to the big scale, from the political to the clim climatic and the, the challenges that, you know, um, countries, all kinds of countries from small islands to bigger countries such as Colombia and Mexico are facing in the region. Um, this is the second global forum that we've got at the AA. So it's, it's been amazing to hear so many different voices in different languages. Perhaps the next one we will also include French. Um, and it is a great experience to see people from all ages, from all backgrounds, from um, all experiences come together to discuss things and to perhaps um, change and improve the situation um, both on that side of the ocean and on this side of the ocean too. Um, I feel really bad closing this event because the discussions have been so lively. So I'm going to put a link to a spatial chat where if you go, you can just continue the conversation and um, talk in smaller groups if you want. It allows you to move around the um, virtual space. And then we will also follow up with a recording of this event and with a survey in which we ask you different ways in which we can re-engage and we can create a strong network amongst alumni, visiting schools, and the AA as well here in London to continue the conversation besides this platform and besides Zoom and to widen our networks and our ideas. Let me know if you have any questions and we will always be here. It's been a pleasure to, to have you all here. Thank you very much.